This is Jill Dando, who was a prominent 37-year-old UK television presenter in the 1990s and was assassinated with a single bullet to the head on the 26th of April 1999 on the doorstep of her London home in broad daylight. The case is still unsolved. After watching this film, if you have been named and want to write to me to clarify anything, please get in touch with me. I'll be happy to put out an update if your information gets us closer to the truth. As you may know, I have made previous films about other high-profile cases, such as the Madeleine McCann case, the Didcot murders and the Cumbria massacres. First, I wish to point out the motivation for making such films. Some true crime filmmakers make their films because they wish to appeal to the public's interest in mysteries and satisfy public curiosity about unsolved police investigations. This is not why I make such films. I believe that in a very small number of criminal cases that the police are not allowed to solve the case. That the police are compromised by higher authority either before the crime occurs or immediately after it and a cover-up operation is put in place to prevent the crime from ever being solved. Sometimes in these cases the police will be directed to solve the case using a bogus narrative and false evidence. In other words, a cover-up is approved from a level above Chief Constable, which would be by the Home Office or by MI5. I could go into the different reasons why a police cover-up might be instigated, but that is not the remit of this film. The possible reason for a police cover-up in the Jill Dando case will become clear as I explain all of the evidence. This is something that true crime reporters will sometimes overlook when they are drawn into high-profile unsolved criminal cases. They wrongly believe that the police are telling the truth about the evidence and they wrongly believe that the police have been trying to solve the case and that the case is just too difficult for them to solve. They don't realise that the case is never meant to be solved nor ever will it be solved by the police. In my opinion, in these admittedly fairly rare cases, the upholders of the law, i.e. the police, are forced to break the law by perverting the course of justice themselves and by covering up evidence and not running a proper investigation. Whenever this happens, it needs to be exposed. Many people have written to me asking my opinion on the Dando case and if I intend to make a film about it. Having carried out detailed research, I now believe that the Jill Dando case was never meant to be solved from word go, by the police at least, and this will become apparent as we go along. The evidence I have uncovered I believe is important enough to be brought to public attention, hence the reason for producing this film. The case is a cover-up, and that's why I am uncovering it in this film. There have been a number of films and reports made about the Dando murder which have put forward theories about the motive for what happened. I will look at all of these theories later in the film and address why there are so many and what evidence supports them. I'll also talk more about Jill Dando and the case itself a bit later. But to start with, there is a story which I need to tell you about in some detail because it's not widely known about and it might be critical in establishing the motive for Jill Dando's murder. The 
This is David Copeland. Copeland is known as the London Nail Bomber and is alleged to have assembled and planted three nail bombs, each one about a week apart, being detonated at various locations around London in April 1999. There's quite a lot to go through before I establish a link to Gildando, so please pay attention and bear with me. All will become clear as we progress. The bombs were contained inside hole dolls and consisted of up to 1,500 nails, killing in total three people and injuring 140. The first bomb was placed on the street of a largely Afro-Caribbean community, Brixton. The second in a street in a Bengali community, Brick Lane, and the third in which three people were killed in a popular gay area in Soho inside the Admiral Duncan pub. Copeland is currently serving a recommended 50-year sentence for these crimes. Copeland was a member of various what are termed far-right groups. He is described as a neo-Nazi. He was a member of the BNP and a member of an organisation called the National Socialist Movement. The basic sequence of events about these bombs is fairly well documented. A number of documentaries have been produced. However, as is often the case with terrorist attacks, sometimes information which is put out by the police and the media is distorted, omitted, added to or concealed for various reasons. And it seems that certain elements of this case have been concealed with the help of a number of mainstream outlets and operatives. It's important first for me to point out the timeline and placement of the various nail bombs. The three bombs were set off on three successive weekends. The first nail bomb was set off on Saturday the 17th of April at 5.26pm on Electric Avenue in Brixton, London. This was near a very busy street market which has a high black population. The bomb injured over 48 people, some seriously. The second nail bomb was set off a week later on Saturday the 24th of April on Brick Lane in London, which is the centre of London's Bangladeshi community, injuring 39 people. The third nail bomb was set off a further week later in the early evening on Friday the 30th of April after being placed inside a pub, the Admiral Duncan in the Soho district of London. The pub is located in the heart of the gay area of Soho, this time the bomb injured 70 and killed three people. The official story contends that Copeland acted alone and was influenced by his far-right beliefs to target black, Asian and gay people. He apparently admitted to planting all three bombs and the first thing he said after police knocked on his door was, they're all down to me and I did them on my own. Note that it took the police 12 days to get the CCTV image of him from Brixton and put it in the newspapers, during which time he planted two further bombs, injuring dozens and killing three. It beggars belief that the CCTV image of him at Brixton was not placed in the media earlier. Various excuses have been put out to try and explain this. None of them are in the slightest bit convincing. If the CCTV images of Copeland had been released earlier, it is highly likely that deaths at Soho would have been prevented. But there is a convincing reason why the CCTV image of Copeland was not put in the media until it was too late, which is that MI5 were interfering, for some reason, with the police investigation and had been watching Copeland for some time, possibly even before the bombings. This will take some explaining, and I'll come back to David Copeland in a moment, but let's have a quick look at the background of Jill Dando and explain what she was like. A very well-liked person in the TV world. In 1997, Dando was voted the BBC Personality of the Year. Not long before her death, she was asked if she would present the BBC's coverage of the upcoming Millennium Celebrations. She was born and brought up in Western Supermare, which is a large town in the southwest of England. She had a middle-of-the-road comprehensive education and studied journalism in Cardiff. 
known widely as a girl next door type of person. She was kind, modest, and had a good sense of humour. It's hard to believe that anyone would be offended by her. After working as a volunteer in her hospital radio in her hometown, she got a job as a trainee reporter in the local weekly newspaper, The Western Mercury. From there, she worked for BBC Local Radio as a newsreader and as a presenter on local television before getting her break in national television in 1988. She started at Crime Watch in 1995, which was a very popular national UK crime programme and at the time of her death in 1999 was one of the most high-profile TV presenters in the country. She'd never been married and after a number of relationships met gynaecologist Alan Farthing in December 97 and they announced their engagement in January 99. They were planning to have a child. During my investigation I have met or spoken to three people who knew Jill personally and I can report that she was a very happy person and delighted to be getting married. You couldn't paint a rosier picture. Let's watch this clip with Noel Edmonds just to see what a natural, intelligent, but modest person she was. I've never seen anyone blush like this on camera before. <laughs> so you blush just now. Actually. Yeah, it's your dad. <laughs> I just stalled at the stop go boards and um, the workman has decided that he's not going to let me go because it took me too long to start the engine again. Ah, we can go. Good. Unicyclist, a warning unicyclist ahead. And she was also a very perceptive television presenter. Robbery. Um, there were around 200 items of antiques, paintings, and silverware. Included in that was uh, this painting. It's a photograph of the painting that was stolen. Uh, this is a painting of uh, a lady called Henrietta Nelson, who uh, died in 1815, was buried in the grounds of her home at uh, Yaxley Hall in Suffolk. New owners of the hall, however, moved the grave and buried her in the uh, family vault. As a result, uh, spirit uh, roamed the grounds. So I'd imagine they'd be quite keen to get rid of that portrait as we'd, quickly as possible. We'd like to think so, yeah. There are numerous indications which suggest that there were more to the London nail bombings of 1909 than just Copeland acting alone, and that security services may have had foreknowledge of what was to occur. I'm going to be referring to the work of Dr. Larry O'Hara, who investigates and exposes the activities of the intelligence agencies in his magazine, Notes from the Borderland. O'Hara has studied and written about the David Copeland bombings extensively. He was at Copeland's trial and has written about MI5's role in the whole affair. His magazines contain some very detailed analysis of the bombings and explore all of the anomalies within the official version of events. If you want to order copies of his articles, they can be obtained from this link and are in issues 3, 4, 5 and 6. The first article he wrote is some 25 pages long, followed by further, shorter articles. The articles are fully referenced with footnotes. I don't have time in this film to read the entire articles, but I will summarise them and read some extracts of what I consider are the most important parts. The title of his first article says it all. Did MI5 police and their media assets allow Copeland to plant his bombs and cover up before, during and after? This might sound unbelievable to anyone who has not studied terrorist attacks in any detail, but it has been shown by many researchers over the years that government agencies are often involved in or facilitate acts of terrorism for a host of political agendas. I'm going to go through the timeline of events, pointing out some of the key anomalies using Larry O'Hara's detailed articles, which shed light on what likely really did happen with the London nail bombs. 
CCTV was shown at the trial showing Copeland's movements in the days leading up to the first bombing, buying the materials for the bomb, and also CCTV showing his movements immediately before planting the bomb. Here's some quotes from Larry O'Hara. The film Sean covered his getting into a taxi at Clapham Junction at 3.30pm. Not screened was visiting a pub for 20 minutes just before. Significant? Perhaps. If Copeland did meet anybody before the bombing, this would have been a good time and place. Also shown was intermittent footage of Copeland's presence in Brixton between 3.53pm and 4.36pm when he walked past McDonald's restaurant. There was then a 20 minute gap until footage shown resumed at 4.56pm. Maybe this film wasn't shown for technical reasons, we shall see. In a confusion that may be legitimate, footage showing Copeland actually planting the device had on it the time 3.34pm. Both the judge, Michael Hyam, Recorder of London, and prosecuting counsel Nigel Sweeney, with no demur from the defence, whose lead QC Michael Walkind spent much time playing computer games on a personal organiser, repeatedly stressed times shown on a videotape may be inaccurate. A valid point, certainly. However, this could also be a useful way of discrediting priori close temporal analysis of the sort here undertaken, for obvious reasons. There was opportunity for Copeland to liaise with others, even in Brixton during his short visit to the Tate Gardens Library, for example. Unlikely, but possible. The footage shown, and witnesses called, about what happened to the bag after Copeland placed it rang true. This encompassed at first sight bizarre events, the bomb being moved numerous times, the bag it was in being stolen, and the security guard at Iceland's store vainly trying to warn passers-by. Unlike earlier coverage of Copeland's activities that day, this sequence of events was substantiated by mutually reinforcing witness statements and footage. An article from The Independent stated, the bomb had been picked up by market traders and passed around to find out who it belonged to. George Jones, 42, said, A hold all was handed to me by somebody who said someone had forgotten their shopping. I unzipped it and opened it wide, and I could see what it was. It was a square device with sticky tape and nails. I picked it up and put it by a brick wall to stop people getting hurt. Then it went off. I was blown across the road, and a couple of nails lodged in my leg, and I was hit by concrete and glass. O'Hara's article continues. It is beyond dispute that Copeland purchased materials for the bomb, took it to Brixton and left it, intending for it to explode, which it did. O'Hara points out that MI5 were involved very early on in the investigation because of an article in the News of the World published the day after the bomb, which claimed MI5 took control of the investigation last night as intelligence reports suggest the blast could have been the work of Serb militants. We know now the blast was not the work of Serb militants, and Larry O'Hara points out that the author of the article was a favoured police conduit. So it is likely that MI5 were involved at this stage. Larry O'Hara's article claims that MI5 copied all of the CCTV footage obtained by the police. On the 19th of April, two days after the bombing, a phone call was received from a phone box in Wellhall Road from a person claiming to be from a member of the far-right group, Combat 18, admitting responsibility for the bombing. This call was recorded by the police. But a decision was made by police, or MI5, not to play the call to the public. Larry O'Hara claims that the phone call was due to be played on the Crime Watch appeal, but for some reason was not aired. This could mean somebody within the investigation already knew at this point that the caller claiming to be from Combat 18 was not the bomber. Further calls from other far-right groups followed, but police decided they were probably all bogus. We had several calls from people purporting to be from extreme right-wing groups uh, claiming association and indeed supporting the fact that the bomb had gone off. There was no intelligence or nothing to support that any of them were in actual fact responsible for the bomb.
Larry O'Hara now goes on to discuss the CCTV evidence and why it took 12 days to get an image of Copeland out to the public. There is the disturbing question of what happened to the Brixton film footage. Looked at superficially, we are asked to believe it took over 12 days between the 17th of the 4th and the 29th of the 4th for this footage to be analysed, still photographs developed sufficiently realistic to publicly release. On closer examination, that turns out to be only partly the case. It is worth remembering there are two vitally important and distinct pieces of relevant film. The first is that of Copeland, as seen by the camera, positioned inside the Iceland food store near to the bus stop where he placed the bomb. Unsurprisingly, given its function to detect shoplifters, that camera only shows the doorway. According to DCI Maureen Boyle, anti-terrorist squad officer in charge, we identified the man that we believe planted the bomb on the Iceland camera after officers spent many hours going through frame by frame. Jason Benito, that faithful voice of Scotland Yard, was more specific. He stated the first smudge or sighting of the bomber was made on the 19th of April from cameras filming the doorway of the Iceland food store. Another version says identification was only made by the 28th of the 4th. According to two directly police sourced accounts, it took six days to decipher this footage and by the 23rd of the 4th, it was sent to the Ministry of Defence and NASA in the USA. It is not in doubt that this film went to the US for enhancement. But there is more to it than that. For a start, such a delay and the necessity of going overseas is ridiculous. When, for example, Selfridge's store on Oxford Street could have processed seized footage in an hour. It defies logic to believe that the Met Police, given the ubiquity of cameras, don't possess such facilities. It is important to distinguish between taking a still from CCTV film and enhancing a picture so obtained. The suspicion has to be this footage was analysed far earlier, from the 19th of April on, than it was released. The logic would be that even at this stage there were other motives at play than merely finding the Brixton bomber, or indeed somebody, MI5 for example, had already worked out who he was. Larry O'Hara then gives an example of where MI5 in the past have deliberately delayed the release of CCTV images showing IRA terrorists. I want you to make a mental note of this, that Larry O'Hara believes MI5 may have already known who the Brixton bomber was on or before Monday the 19th of April 99. Make a note of that date. His article goes on. The footage eventually used in the public domain to identify Copeland was not from Iceland's camera at all, but from an elevated camera. It shows him standing on the left and in front of two black men, and patently did not come from any shop camera. The fact is implicitly admitted in an official police account, mentioning that while the Iceland image was being looked at elsewhere, detectives continued their work of trying to identify further images of Copeland. Nothing in the key disinformational text by McLagan and Lowell's Mr. Evil contradicts this interpretation. Indeed, they admit that, within hours of the bombing, the police had obtained all the recordings for that Saturday afternoon, page 126. Not surprisingly, given the prominence of this publication, the authors do not distinguish between the Iceland footage and the elevation camera product. To have drawn attention to that would have laid bare what seems like a crucial police or state deception. A good picture of Copeland, the one eventually used successfully, did not have to be obtained from overseas, but was already at hand before the 29th of the 4th, as early as the 19th of the 4th in fact. In this respect, incessant reference to police retrieving 1,094 CCTV tapes with 26,000 hours of recording and spending 4,000 man-hours viewing them is also highly beside the point. For given there was a known location reference, where the bomb went off, and an exact time, as all cameras would have been jolted by the blast, the indisputably painstaking work necessary was not quite looking for a needle in a haystack. Larry O'Hara proposes that MI5 knew who Copeland was, knew what he was going to do, and did not want him identified just yet. He had two more bombs to plant, and as O'Hara states, his actions seemed to fit their agenda, 
the Imminent Terrorism Act. The second nail bombing, the following Saturday, is also analysed in detail by Larry O'Hara. Copeland was captured on CCTV at various stores, buying all the components for his second bomb at different times in the week leading up to the second bombing. He was caught on CCTV on his way to plant the Brick Lane bomb at Waterloo train station and also getting into a taxi. Copeland placed the bomb outside 32 Hanbury Street and it is claimed there is CCTV footage of him in Hanbury Street. But curiously, this footage was not shown at the trial, and I am not aware it has been shown anywhere. After the bomb was placed outside 32 Hanbury Street, it was then moved by a member of the public, Irishman Gerard Lynch, who thought it was a bag of tools. He carried it to his car 250 metres away on Brick Lane and put it in the boot. At some point he became suspicious about it and so left it in the boot and went to report it to the police. The bomb detonated whilst it was in the boot of his car. The area of Brick Lane and Hanbury Street is covered by CCTV, so there should have been continuous footage of Copeland as he arrives to the time he leaves. Larry O'Hara continues. Film of Copeland in Brick Lane was not shown in the court although the existence of film showing Copeland with a bag in Hanbury Street and Commercial Street and placing the bomb outside 32 Hanbury Street was referred to, and one paper showed a still purporting to be Copeland in Brick Lane. In Mr Evil is claimed there was no film of Copeland in Brick Lane, either a typically sloppy mistake or a purposeful lie. So, even more than with Brixton, there is at least 40 minutes of Copeland in the vicinity of a target, not in its entirety accounted for by material actually shown. Indeed, the only footage of events in Brick Lane showed a motorist, Irishman Gerard Lynch, parking his car, putting the bag containing the bomb in the boot of it, and walking away, first to the closed police substation in Brick Lane, and then off camera towards Lehman Street when the bomb went off and his testimony, including initially mistaking the bomb for a set of workmen's tools, is one aspect of this case that does seem credible. Copeland, in his statement to police, claims he made a silent 999 call from a call box at 5.10pm in Digby Street nearby. Allegedly, he decided to dump the bomb while still live, even though there was no market. The alternative explanation already suggested is this bomb at this time was no accident. Although Copeland claims plausibly to have then visited Soho by cab to reconnoitre his next target, this too was not shown on film. Indeed, there has been no response to police appeals in newspapers and magazines for whoever may have picked him up in the Brick Lane area to contact Scotland Yard. Again, while this may be for some innocent reason, another explanation fits the known facts, which would be that on arrival in Brick Lane, if not before, Copeland was tailed by a person or persons whose identity a section of the state wants to conceal. This is given credence by the most suspicious bombing of all, Soho. So Larry O'Hara believes authorities, perhaps Special Branch or MI5, may have been observing Copeland before he planted the second nail bomb. Before planting his third bomb inside a pub in Soho, Copeland was in the Soho area the day before, on the 29th of April, and visited the pub. It was on this afternoon that the image of Copeland first appeared in the media in the Evening Standard, and then in mainstream papers the following day. Time was running short for him, so he returned to his home in Farnborough to get the contents of his next bomb, then went back to London that evening where he checked into a hotel under a false name on St George's Drive, Victoria, the night of the 29th. No CCTV of him on that night arriving in London was shown in the court. Copeland made phone calls from a payphone outside the hotel, but it was not revealed who he called. 
On the morning of the 30th, he checked out of the hotel and into a second hotel where he prepared the next bomb. This was placed on the floor beside the bar of the Admiral Duncan pub on Old Compton Street and detonated at 6.37pm. Again, I will quote from Larry O'Hara. Copeland made his way to Soho. Arriving early, Copeland went to a so-called straight pub for half an hour. Needless to say, neither the name of the pub or any footage of Copeland approaching, entering, leaving it was shown. Yet again though, surely relevant and possible given there are supposedly at least 126 cameras visible to the naked eye alone in Soho. Footage was played of Copeland passing two shops at number 62 and 64 Compton Street, at first with the bag containing the bomb and later without it. It is well established Copeland left the bomb in the Admiral Duncan pub at 6pm and left it between 5 and 10 past 6. The bomb exploded around 6.37pm, killing John Light, Nick Moore and the pregnant Andrea Dykes. That there is something suspect about the Soho bombing is given credence by an amazing story in Gay and Lesbian Weekly. The pink paper, which went to press three days before the bomb, although dated Friday the 30th of April. Written by David Northmore, the front page lead stated, Gay communities around the country were on bomb alert this week after a second nail bomb in London last weekend. The next sentence stood out, claiming, Home office, police and gay businesses are urging gays and lesbians to be particularly vigilant. Home office in this context patently refers to MI5, the security service. Thus we have, on the very day of the Soho bomb, a public hint MI5 thought gays a possible target. Afterwards, Northmore then felt the need to deny foreknowledge. Writing in The Independent, he wrote, Did the pink paper receive a tip-off that such an attack would take place? Absolutely not. Had there been such information, we would have worked with the police to prevent the event from happening. O'Hara also states that ex-naval commander Duncan Lustig Preen, who campaigns for gay rights in the armed forces, said, MI5 sources informed me three days before the explosion that their intelligence was far more pessimistic over the gay angle than the Met Police position. And in an email sent six days before the Soho bomb, he wrote, Intelligence sources with whom I remain in contact have advised me that Combat 18 are almost certain to be behind the two explosions in London recently. Sources say that Combat 18 has been planning such attacks for several months. There is also a possibility that they will also attempt to target the gay community. Note that the NSM, of which Copeland was a member, originated from a faction of Combat 18. Immediately after the bombing, Lustig Preen contradicted his first email, stating, I know from my contacts that even MI5 bounced by sudden change to LGBT target. Apparently, Lustig Preen's views regularly appear in the pink paper, and O'Hara suggests that Lustig Preen's credible links to MI5 may have been the channel that the original information came from to David Northmore. In Larry O'Hara's Issue 5 article, he explains how he was given information by a reliable source who was privy to aspects of the unfolding police investigation and asked searching questions. Intermittently, stories have surfaced Copeland was under surveillance when planting the Soho bomb. Two important pieces of new information flesh out this rumour. First is reported comments by Scotland Yard's Detective Chief Superintendent Bunn to a pre-trial briefing under the auspices of John Grieve to interested parties, 1st of June 2000. According to someone present, now this someone was later named as Outrage founder member John Beeson, who was heard saying it by Simon Forbes, a member of the Met LGBT Advisory Committee. So, according to someone present, Bunn said of Copeland in Soho, we were tracking him. Unfortunately, he gave us the slip. That's what caused the bomb to go off. In a later article, O'Hara gives more on this. There is yet more, which Forbes did not say, in print here for the first time. In particular, at a pre-trial briefing in June 2000, Steve Greenwood, co-chair of LGBT Advisory Group, Linda Bellos, also co-chair and ex-Lambeth Council leader, along with Jerry Gable, Searchlight publisher, were shown by police extensive footage of Copeland being monitored in Soho on the 30th of April 99. 
His article goes on, in the email from prominent gay rights campaigner Peter Tatchell to an enquirer dated the 27th of June 2002, according to Tatchell, West End Central Police Station received a phone call about half an hour before the bomb went off. The phone call was from a special branch unit saying that they had lost their suspect in or near Broadwick Street. They requested backup. Their description of the suspect fitted Copeland's appearance and the bag he was carrying. The significance of this cannot be overstated. Special Branch were following Copeland before he planted the Soho bomb, therefore could have apprehended him at any time and prevented three deaths and 70 injuries, making them complicit in the bombing. Larry O'Hara also points out that if MI5 did have foreknowledge that the gay community were Copeland's next target, this foreknowledge might have been gathered if he was followed immediately after his Brick Lane bombing, when he is alleged to have travelled to Soho to decide on his next target. O'Hara also points out the possibility that Copeland was being steered and manipulated throughout his campaign by agent provocateurs, i.e. agents of the state. O'Hara's SU5 article goes on. While MI5 have no powers of arrest, it is unlikely they would entirely delegate watching Copeland to Special Branch. After all, there was no desire to stop Copeland. Indeed, MI5's aim may well have been to facilitate his campaign. So MI5 probably had their own unit independently shadowing both Copeland and Special Branch. O'Hara talks about the magazine Searchlight which ostensibly publishes exposés of racism, anti-Semitism and fascism in the UK. However, O'Hara explains how he believes Searchlight is actually an MI5 front publication used for a host of nefarious state operations. Searchlight claims to have moles embedded in certain organisations such as the BNP, of which Copeland had been a member. O'Hara states, I know of no Searchlight asset who does not, on examination, turn out to be an agent provocateur or at the very least facilitator of violence. O'Hara discusses a searchlight mole known as Arthur, who was a BNP infiltrator and monitored Copeland. He then spells out his reasons for believing that Arthur could have been Copeland's manipulator or handler and influenced him towards his crimes. He goes on to point out anomalies surrounding Searchlight's claim that they alerted Special Branch to Copeland's identity after his CCTV photograph was released. He explains that he believes this was deliberately delayed and that Copeland's name was merely added to a long list of other names rather than given to them individually. So in other words, he's claiming there was skullduggery going on regarding the release by Searchlight of Copeland's identity to the police. O'Hara provides further analysis of the other group Copeland was a member of, the NSM, a far-right group with a small number of members. Two further far-right groups who Copeland denies being involved with are Combat 18 and the alleged group, the White Wolves. I won't go into all the details, but just to point out, there is some overlap with regards to the personnel involved in these groups, and it's difficult to say how much the groups are either infiltrated by state assets or indeed set up by the state in the first place. Here's a comment from a series of World in Action programmes about Combat 18. In spite of the race-hate material contained in these magazines, neither Will Browning nor Charlie Sargent have been charged. While Mark Atkinson, Charlie Sargent and Will Browning continue to push their message in football, the violence they encourage spreads. When I watch these old documentaries about Combat 18 and its links with football violence, links with Northern Ireland loyalist groups, links with United States Ku Klux Klan, I get the feeling there is something disingenuous about these programmes. They're not giving you the whole picture 
and deliberately fail to expose the entirety of state manipulation, which is a key component within such groups. So what conclusions did C18 draw from that incident about the so, role of Sergeant Charlie must have been working with Special Branch. Is it possible that Copeland was involved with or influenced by such groups and that state assets knew about this? Whether he was involved in these groups or not, one thing that does stand out is that Copeland did not take any precautions to prevent being caught. He bought bomb making material near his home and through the post delivered to his home. He kept the bombs at his home. He loitered around the bomb sites for considerable periods of time, being caught on dozens of cameras. He transported the bombs in public taxis. He even wore a very distinctive white baseball cap, which he bought just before his bombing campaign. Was this done deliberately to make him easy to spot? When the police first arrested him, he admitted to all three bombings and stated, they're all down to me, I did them on my own. Then in a police interview stated, I wanted to get caught. The obvious question which arises is, was he a patsy? Two further observations which lend weight to Copeland being helped is firstly the amount of money he spent on the explosives was not readily available to him. And secondly, he was not considered capable of changing a fuse, never mind successfully making and detonating bombs. In my opinion, somebody or some group may have manipulated him, or at the very least were monitoring him and knew what he was going to do, but took measures, probably with the help of the state, not to be identified themselves. There is also the possibility that he was a mind control victim, something I have covered extensively in interviews with Neil Sanders. In his confession statement he said, I don't feel sad about it, I was just like a robot. I just felt nothing. Reading between the lines, MI5 and Special Branch were running an operation involving Copeland, but police and the anti-terror squad were probably not privy to it. It's been suggested that a rift between the two camps arose because of this. Essentially, a rift between MI5 and the police. Here is an article from The Guardian, dated July 2000. There have been several persistent rumours the police had Copeland under surveillance before the Soho blast and lost him. Scotland Yard last night dismissed this as absolutely untrue. Other speculation has suggested there was friction between MI5 and Scotland Yard and that the two clashed over risk assessment. This too has been strongly denied. Hang on, nobody suggested the police were surveilling him. It was Special Branch and possibly MI5 that were surveilling him. The two clashed over risk assessment, meaning Scotland Yard considered Copeland a risk and wanted to arrest him, but MI5 didn't consider him a risk and wanted to observe him. It's easy to see why there may have been friction, as The Guardian put it, between MI5 and the police. I repeat that it took a staggering 12 days to get the CCTV image of him from the Brixton site and put it in a newspaper during which time he detonated two further bombs, injuring dozens and killing three. The two subsequent bombings could easily have been prevented if the police had done their job. I was devastated because we'd, we'd released the images on, on the Thursday. We were actively following lots of information that had come through and we not succeeded in arresting him before he committed his next offence. Let's now come on to Crime Watch and Jill Dando's involvement in the London Nail Bomber case. Just to remind those who aren't familiar, Crime Watch was a very popular BBC National UK TV programme whose purpose was to assist the police via public telephone appeals in solving crimes and Jill Dando was one of the two main presenters. The timing of this particular TV programme is of great importance. As you will recall, the first bomb went off in Brixton on Saturday the 17th of April 99. Crime Watch was a monthly programme and just so happened to be being aired on the 20th of April, just three days after the bombing. 
As part of my investigations, I have met and spoken to the Crime Watch studio director who directed that particular programme on the 20th of April. His name is Peter Morpurgo. I'll come on to that meeting I had with him later in the film, but he told me that the Crime Watch team would usually spend the day before the show airs, in this case Monday the 19th, rehearsing for the Tuesday night show. So to feature an appeal for the Brixton bomb, which only happened late on Saturday the 17th, was fairly short notice. A decision must have been made by the police quite quickly to use Crime Watch for an appeal. And I also suspect that MI5 may have been out of the loop when this decision was made. Incidentally, this particular programme was Jill Dando's last appearance, and she was dead less than six days later. I'm going to show you the entire Crime Watch segment that features the Brixton bombing. But first, I want to home in on one very important statement coming from a member of the public. This is towards the end of the show, and Jill is reading out telephone responses from witnesses. Well, following up with uh, what, on what Nick said earlier about the, the Brixton calls, several uh, calls on that, some very good ones. Some people were seen on a roof in Brixton on the day with binoculars, but obviously we don't know whether they were connected or not. The claim of people being on a rooftop was repeated in a BBC article dated the 21st of April. It states, one caller reported people equipped with binoculars on a rooftop. As we saw earlier, Copeland was being observed and filmed before the Soho bombing and likely also before and after the Brick Lane bombing. The statement from this witness, however, suggests he was probably being watched as it was stated with binoculars also on the day of his first bomb, the Brixton bomb. In order to investigate the claims of people on the roof with binoculars, I went to the Brixton bomb site to see if I could identify where such people may have been situated. Note that the buildings in that area have not changed since the events, so it was fairly easy to identify where any operatives may have been situated. Okay, so I'm here in Brixton and this is the, the spot of the first nail bomb uh, allegedly planted by David Copeland. Uh, now, as we saw in the Crime Watch UK programme, Jill Dando said that there were people on the roof with binoculars, presumably with oversight of the bomb site. Okay, now I've had a good look around the rooftops here, so I'm just going to do a 360 not really anywhere there. And really, I can only identify one place where they may have been. And it's just, sorry, just over my shoulder here uh, on this rooftop. Um, all of the rooftops on the other side of the road are sloped, so you, you wouldn't be able to stand on them. Um, there is a rooftop um, above the tube station, but that doesn't have oversight. So my guess would be one of these rooftops here. You can see there's not many rooftops got visibility of this. I pan round. Well, you know, just another day in Brixton. <laughs> just another day in Brixton, he said. And yeah, I would say my money's on that building there. Of course, this one wouldn't have any visibility of the events. Just, we've got a roof here. So this, this roof would obscure any view uh, from that building, so it must have been on this side.
Bench here. Okay. Right, I'm gonna put the camera down. So, I managed to get onto the roof of the shops of Electric Avenue. So here I am, I'm on the rooftop at Electric Avenue and as you can see over my shoulder is Iceland, perfect vantage point for whoever was involved to watch with binoculars the man in the white baseball cap. I'm just going to, I'll go a little bit further to the back where the, uh, where the statues are, I'll just turn the camera around now. I'd be interested to know when these uh, metal statues of these dogs was put up. Isn't it strange that one of them is looking right, right at the site, right at the site where, where the bomb went off? Okay, I've got to climb down now. So if I can get up here, it's not beyond the wit of some intelligent agent, is it? The vegetable stall behind me, I just asked the guy, I said to him, how long has he had the stall? He said, 86 years. So that's obviously his, his family. Uh, and I asked him when the uh, the dogs, the monument of the dogs, was put on the top of that building. He says about four or five years ago. So they're they're quite recent. Great, the sun's coming out. One thing before I forget, one of the uh, traders said that to get up onto that roof, when they're doing maintenance and that kind of thing, they come, they just come with a very long ladder. So. <clears throat> You don't have to go through to the back of a shop to get on that roof. All you need is a very long ladder. And there are a few points where you could feasibly put that ladder without it being in front of the shop. So you go around the side uh, and get up onto that roof. And another, another one of the traders in the shops said that he thought there used to be access to the roof. Uh, the metal, metal steps or something like that, but I, th that's not there now. So you either need a ladder, as it is now, you either need a ladder or to go through one of the shops. Okay, I'm still in Brixton and I've got the address of one of the witnesses. This is Gary Schilling, who moved the bag that had been left by Copeland before it went off. And I just spoke to a market trader there and he said that they were they weren't right at the site, but they were in a nearby pub and they heard the windows shake. And he said, oh yeah, he was checking to see if there was anything in it worth nicking. That's what the market trader said, but I think he was just saying that as a joke. I'm gonna walk down to electric avenue. So I'm back in my low budget hotel room, but um, today I've been all over London. I've been to the three nail bomb sites I then went uh, to where Jill Dando used to live and I filmed in her street there in Fulham. Uh, so I'm absolutely wrecked. My ankles are killing, uh, but it's been a really successful day. We know the police had CCTV images of Copeland on the 19th of April, which was the day before the Crime Watch show aired. But a decision was made by someone not to release these images until the 29th of April. Therefore, no image of him was shown on the TV show Appeal, but I would argue could have been. Let's now watch the Crime Watch Appeal in its entirety, bearing in mind what we now know about the controversy surrounding these bombings, and that MI5 and Special Branch were probably against putting this appeal out, for the reasons I have explained previously. Britain's most important unsolved cases. Now live, you can help solve them. The homemade bomb that exploded in South London on Saturday seems to have been an act of lunacy. It wasn't the IRA, and though an anonymous phone call claimed it was a tiny fascist group, there's no evidence for that. And in any case, who would want to hurt young and old, even this baby? 
black and white shoppers and market traders. Anyone, in fact, with the randomness of an exploding bag of nails. But tonight, you can help, and this is how. This is the quantity of nails packed around the explosives. There are between six and ten pounds in weight here, and believe me, that's a fairly hefty bulk of nails. They're all round nails, and they range from this size to this. Now, who bought them? If you work in a hardware merchant or in a DIY store, think back over the last few weeks. Who bought this lot? It wasn't a regular customer, it isn't a regular builder. Who came in for this sort of quantity of nails? Or alternatively, did you sell a bag like this? Now, I know these things are fairly common, but this one is fairly new. And see if you can connect this and selling this to something else that we're about to tell you. Alan Fry is the head of the anti-terrorist branch. Alan, a lot of publicity you've had for this already. I mean, what more can people do? Police are anxious to talk to anybody who was in the Brixton Road by the bus stops by Electric Avenue at about five o'clock last Saturday. Uh, whether they were just walking past, uh, shopping, standing at, waiting for a bus, or even on a bus. That could be thousands of people, literally. I appreciate that, but any one of them, maybe unwittingly, has the vital key to this investigation. E even if they don't think they saw anything particularly? Yes, let us be the decider. Okay, now, if this was a, a small extremist group, by their nature, these little bands of people tend to have an awful lot of, of leaks, as it were. An awful lot of people tend to hear what's going on. Yes, and, and almost certainly someone's heard them planning, someone's been party to that uh, planning. They may have disagreed with the plan. This may be a renegade. Uh, what I would ask is for anyone in that position with any knowledge to talk to us in confidence. Of course, what seems quite likely in this is it's a loner with a grudge. Well, it could be a loner. It could be someone... Uh, have you seen someone acting suspiciously, out of character? Uh, indeed, have, do you know of someone who has purchased a large number of nails? They may have been seen with a sports bag, which itself is out of character. Uh, more importantly, do you know someone who has literature on the making of bombs? Have they boasted about making bombs? Do they experiment with explosives? Do you think whoever, whoever did this will have tried to detonate something like it before? I, I think that is certain. We have to act within the law, within data protection, um, and I, I think um, we sometimes have an expectation of the tentacles of the security service uh, which are far wider uh, than their actual role, uh, their, their actual scope uh, and their ability. Okay, well if there's any way that you think you can help, please please do. There's a £10,000 reward. That may go up. We've had an astonishing response on the Brixton nail bomb attack. We've learned that great samples of nails and sometimes great boxes are available at several stores, some of which have CCTV cameras in them. We've learned that in building sites often there are, all the nails are kept together, so maybe somebody who, who did this is involved with uh, a building site. And there is a, an extraordinary call here, someone saying that they saw people acting very suspiciously indeed. And we'll tell you a little more about that once we've cleared that later on. We, the phones are under siege at the moment. On the Brixton nail bomb, we've really had some fascinating calls. As I said earlier, we've got people who were in the area, a couple of very interesting calls, which I really can't give you anything more about at the moment. We've had about 60... Well, following up with uh, what, on what Nick said earlier about the, the... In body language studies, this gesture is the brain's attempt to block out deceit, doubt or a lie that it sees. Women use a small, gentle rubbing motion just below the eye either because they have been brought up to avoid making robust gestures or to avoid smudging makeup. Brixton calls, several uh, calls on that, some very good ones. Some people were seen on a roof in Brixton on the day with binoculars, but obviously we don't know whether they were connected or not. Standing next to Jill is Chief Superintendent David Hatcher. Watch his body language when Jill talks about the people on the roof with binoculars. He knows he's on camera, so he's trying to look nonchalant. But the way he moves suddenly and takes his glasses off to look around the studio suggests to me he is not comfortable with Jill saying this, as if to check whether permission was granted. Brixton calls, several uh, calls on that, some very good ones. Some people were seen on a roof in Brixton on the day with binoculars, but obviously we don't know whether they were connected or not. Um, many calls giving us details about where the nails can be bought, uh, centering on pound shops. So we don't really want any more calls on that. On the uh, murder of a Swedish tourist, well, uh, we had... Uh, one... 
Perhaps Scotland Yard or the anti-terror squad who were involved in making this programme were upset at having their hands tied by MI5 and thought they would allow some beans to be spilled about MI5's covert operation. In my research into this case, I have tried to get access to the Crime Watch update report. This is a short update that normally follows the main Crime Watch program informing viewers of any progress about the cases discussed. I offered to pay the BBC whatever price was required just to be able to view the update as part of my research. Not necessarily to use it in this film, but just for me to view it. And they replied, Hi Richard, I'm afraid we can't help with your request. We cannot supply copies of BBC programmes footage to members of the public or companies for research, education or personal use, I'm afraid. Isn't it a disgrace that a publicly funded organisation like the BBC will not allow me just to view an old programme, never mind include it in my film, which I know they have a copy of because I have met the Crime Watch studio director, Peter Morpurgo, who told me they were archived on one-inch tape. I'd be very interested to watch the Crime Watch update from the 20th of April 99. If anyone has a copy of it on a VHS tape in their loft, please get in touch. When I first started looking into the Dando murder, I reasoned like this. There's very little in Dando's character or background that suggests she had any enemies. She's like a female version of Alan Titchmarsh. No one would murder Alan Titchmarsh. I felt it was highly likely, therefore, that the reason for her sudden murder was linked in some way to her role on Crime Watch. Her murder seemed to me as though it had been planned and carried out at very short notice. The fact it was a daylight shooting on a London street suggests that there was not enough time to plan a more sophisticated operation. So let's take a look at it. Most commentators agree the murder was professionally executed. Jill was living most of the time at her fiancé's house with Alan Farthing in Chiswick, three miles from her own house but would occasionally pop home to retrieve faxes and other things. She was returning to her home by car shortly after 11.30am on Monday morning. She parked in the street and as she was putting her key in the door was approached from behind, forced down to the ground so that her head nearly touched the tiled step before a 9mm calibre pistol was pressed against her temple and fired, the bullet having been crimped to reduce the noise of the blast. Analysis of the wound and the scene revealed the murder was quick and drew little initial attention from the public. Her body lying at the front door for 14 minutes before being discovered gave the perpetrator plenty of time to run off up the street, heading west towards Fulham Palace Road. The killer was seen by two of her neighbours leaving the scene, but at that time neither realised he had just killed Jill. From these witnesses, he was wearing a dark brown thigh-length jacket, was mid to late thirties, had collar-length thick black hair, was white, around five foot ten. Richard Hughes, who saw the killer's face, said the killer was thick-set like a rugby player or a soldier, had a jowly face and looked like TV presenter Bob Mills. Immediately after this, there are numerous sightings of a man running down Fulham Palace Road, then a sighting of a man running into the park, then of a man wearing a dark thigh-length coat in the park, acting oddly. Finally, a man was seen coming out of the park, who then stood at a bus stop on Fulham Palace Road. He was sweating a lot and out of breath, as if he had been running. However, the man at the bus stop was wearing a suit, not a thigh-length jacket, and had dark hair, but shorter hair than was seen by the first two witnesses. He did not get on the bus with the other passengers when it arrived at 11.45am, but waited one minute and got on the next one and paid to go to Putney Station. He was not seen getting off that bus at Putney Station with all the other passengers, so must have got off earlier. Around this time, a metallic blue Range Rover was seen on CCTV speeding out of Donorail Street. It is possible he was picked up by the Range Rover. One of the journalists to report from the scene was this man, who you might recognise from my Madeleine McCann films. Jill was killed, as you say, by a single gunshot to the head, uh, and that she died of a brain injury caused by a single bullet. 
There had been concern mid-afternoon uh, after reports that a man had been seen acting suspiciously on Putney Bridge, quite close to here, uh, whether or not he jumped into the Thames, as one report said. It seems it's a small world when it comes to government cover-ups. One of the eyewitnesses who got a very close view of the man at the bus stop drew up this EFIT. He described the suspect as slightly foreign-looking. The EFIT might be the killer, but there is considerable doubt about this because this man was wearing a suit, not a dark brown thigh-length jacket, and had shorter hair. But for now, I want to stay on the possibility that the Crime Watch TV programme is linked to the motive. Well, dramatic developments tonight after a post-mortem examination showed that Jill Dando died from a brain injury caused by a single bullet wound to the head. It does seem increasingly likely tonight that this could be the work of a professional hitman, though Scotland Yard are refusing to comment on that theory. But it does seem tonight that Jill Dando's high-profile role presenting a national crime programme could be connected with her murder. Certainly the post-mortem result does suggest that a hitman could be responsible. So far the weapon that he used hasn't been found. When I decided to study this case, I discussed it with an associate of mine, and I suggested that we should watch the Crime Watch programmes which aired immediately before her murder, to see if any of the many cases covered in the programmes might provide a clue to the motive for her death. It was my associate that highlighted to me the Copeland story, and once we appreciated the full truth about that story, largely by looking at Larry O'Hara's investigation, and then compared the timing of the case with the timing of Jill Dando's murder, a clear motive emerged. From these Crime Watch clips, I think it is possible that Dando was privy to sensitive information within the Brixton bombing investigation, which was not aired on television. We know the CCTV image of Copeland was available the day before this show, on the 19th of April. Did she see that image in the rehearsal? because the police wanted to air it in their appeal, but were prevented from showing it by MI5? Did Dando learn the name of David Copeland as being the main suspect, as a result of either information from members of the public phoning the show, or intelligence given to her by the police? Was the phone call police recorded alleging to be the bomber actually made by David Copeland, and had Dando heard that call? If she did learn information about the identity of the bomber nine days before they released his photograph, which was also four days before the second bomb was due to be placed, and a full ten days before the Soho bomb was due to be placed, would that not mean she was in possession of very sensitive information? Information that somebody could not afford to be made public? Let's also point out that the day after Jill was murdered, she was due to read the National 6 o'clock news live on television. I am not suggesting that she would have blurted out what she knew about David Copeland live on the news. I am just drawing your attention to the fact that she had a very high profile in the media and had numerous platforms available to her to put out information, even if she needed to put it out through a third party. Let's take a look at the timeline of events incorporating the Dando murder and the nail bombings. Saturday the 17th of April, Brixton bomb detonated, probably being observed by Special Branch and MI5. Tuesday the 20th of April, Crime Watch appeal, which received very good information, Jill Dando possibly gleaning information about the identity of the bomber. Saturday the 24th of April, Brick Lane bomb detonated. Monday the 26th of April, Jill Dando murdered. Thursday the 29th of April, Copeland's photograph appears in the media. Friday the 30th of April, Soho bomb detonated, killing three. Saturday the 1st of May, 1.20am, Copeland arrested and admits to all three bombs. If Dando was murdered because of what she found out about David Copeland, it took five days to authorise the hit find a suitable hitman or team, then plan and execute the assassination. That time frame, five days, seems quite plausible to me. Now, once you've realised this potential motive for Jill Dando's murder, and we are going to look at other motives, you might ask the question, assuming this was the motive, why didn't they kill Nick Ross too? 
or indeed some of the other police officer presenters who might have known the same information. Firstly, the other presenters and people behind the scenes do not have Jill Dando's media profile. They do not read the six o'clock news and have probably all signed the Official Secrets Act and may have been firmly reminded of this after that particular show. They do not have access to a live media platform. Secondly, let's come on to the very interesting character, Jill's co-presenter, Nick Ross. There are several things to point out about Ross. He studied at Belfast University in the late 1960s, where he became interested in the sectarian issues and was a student activist. For no particularly good reason, I found myself elected to represent the halls of residence here at the Student Union. And this now rather grubby looking building, then brand new, was about to become the cockpit of political dissension. This uh, parochial eating and meeting place was soon to find itself at the heart of events that would reverberate around the world. Then soon after university started his career as a newsreader for the BBC in Northern Ireland. He has been involved in current affairs shows covering crime, the law and issues like drug addiction and in 1998 made a prominent documentary broadcast by the BBC called We Shall Overcome, which covered the political power struggle in Northern Ireland. Ross comes across as being sympathetic to the Nationalist Republicans and supporting their need for civil rights, but stops short at saying Northern Ireland should be made part of the Republic. Ross appeases the Republicans, but without agreeing with their ultimate cause. When I came over here very quickly, my sympathies were allied to the nationalist population. It seemed that they were discriminated against. They were second-class citizens. Was I wrong? I was despairing of the Catholic tendency to lapse into a romanticised nationalism that causes people to get killed. Thousands of people on both sides have died in this war, and I think any balanced observer would agree that the BBC did not present and does not present the Northern Ireland issue in a balanced way. It is pro-UK, pro the British monarchy, pro keeping Northern Ireland part of the UK. So I would suggest that one of the BBC's key front men who has covered this issue in detail would probably be an asset of MI5. I suspect Nick Ross may have been made an agent of the state decades before his involvement in Crime Watch, possibly when he was a student. Therefore, in my view, he's not the sort of person likely to give away state secrets. A safe pair of hands, you might say. Jill Dando, however, presented holiday programmes, sipping martini in the sun, and is far less likely in her past life to have been recruited by the secret state. Another important point to bear in mind about Ross is that he campaigned vigorously against Barry George, who I will come on to, the man who was wrongly convicted of Jill Dando's murder and spent eight years in prison for a crime he did not commit. In 2016, Ross said, I thought that the evidence against him was very compelling, indeed, as long as you think of evidence not in the way that an English court thinks of evidence. Was an exactly. over, a, overwhelming mass of circumstantial evidence. Overwhelming evidence of things where the arrows pointed at his guilt. Nick Ross implies in this interview that he still believes Barry George is guilty. This is a strange stance for somebody who claims to be interested in truth and justice. The question arises, does Nick Ross know more about the Jill Dando murder than he lets on? And does he know whether the state had any involvement? I'm going to look at some quotes by Nick Ross and an audio interview he gave in 2016. Viewers may know that in the past I have commissioned the work of Peter Hyatt, a US-based expert in analysing people's statements for deception and also for ascertaining why people are lying and what they are lying about. Something that Peter regularly points out is that if somebody makes a statement containing a negative assertion when they have not been prompted for that information, then we must be on high alert for deception. As Bill Clinton once said, I did not have sexual relations with that woman. I have had a short quote which Nick Ross made on the day of Jill's murder analysed by Peter Hyatt and he has also analysed a lengthy audio interview that Ross gave in 2016. Before I look at Peter's analysis, here is an article written by Nick Ross in the Daily Mail staggeringly the very next day after Jill's murder. 
Jill's murder became public on the afternoon of the 26th, and he writes a detailed article in time for publication the following morning. He must have written this on the day Jill was murdered. The article speaks of her long legs and having a figure to die for. Then another article is published the same day in the Evening Standard, poignantly titled, Nick Ross, I Don't Think Crime Watch Is The Link. How the hell would he know that? The fact he makes this negative assertion suggests to me that not only is Crime Watch probably the link, but that he knows Crime Watch is probably the link. So here is a direct quote from that article, made on the day of the murder, which has been analysed by Peter Hyatt. There has been no indication that Crime Watch or any other programme would put a presenter at threat. There has never been any sort of threat received by Crime Watch. I think everybody is grasping at straws. We hate the ambiguity and want to know what happened. I don't just think it is premature, I think it is daft to look for Crime Watch connections, except as one of a hundred other things that have to be looked at. I will present Peter's analysis of this statement in the next part of the film, along with his analysis of Nick Ross's 2016 audio interview. Here is what expert in statement analysis Peter Hyatt said about this statement. This statement is highly in the negative, which increases importance for us. One, there has been no indication. Two, there has never been any sort of threat. Three, I don't just think it is premature. Given the context and dating of the statement, including that this is a show about crime, this is a most unexpected and unnecessary statement. In any unsolved crime, the investigation is wide open. A show that is about crime knows this as well as anyone. If this was said years later, it would have likely less weakness in assertion. Why does Nick Ross have a need to so very quickly eliminate this possibility? Note that in context, a programme might find the publicity, including the intrigue of a possible connection, to be invaluable publicity. If there is no connection, why would the subject have the need to ridicule with daft? The reporting of what has not happened and what he does not think is combined with the need to ridicule rather than report. The change in pronoun from we to I shows an increase in importance to the speaker himself personally. Why would he have a personal need to ridicule this? His assertion comes off as powerful, which statement analysis reveals to the contrary. It is the need to sound so persuasive itself that we find the weakness. In 2016, Nick Ross spoke about Jill Dando's murder in an hour-long interview for a series called Media Masters. I have picked out some key paragraphs and had them analysed by a professional analyst for possible deception. You can find the full analysis by following this link, but here I will present the parts relevant to the murder and some of the conclusions. Yeah. And what was that like to, to have to, you know, open a show with a reconstruction of, of the murder of, of one of your own show's presenters? Some of the press afterwards made it sound as though Jill and I were sort of very, very close friends, um, which we weren't. I mean, we used to go out to dinner with our respective spouses, uh, or in her, her case, fiancé, every now and then. But we were colleagues. Mm. On the other hand, we were very close colleagues. We liked each other a lot. There's been an allegation here of an inappropriate relationship with Jill and a denial. He gives a strong denial of an inappropriate relationship at that time. His use of the pronoun we, which shows unity and cooperation, confirms his claim of close colleagues. This is a truthful assertion from his perspective. It is important to note what the insinuation of the press is met with. We weren't. He then goes on to describe the relationship. His denial is simply, we weren't. He has no need to revisit it with more denials, qualifications, nor ridicule. This is a strong denial that he does not feel the need to attempt to strengthen. In contrast, compare this denial to his original denial about connection between the programme and her death. This comparison is very important because it uses its own reference point. There are two accusations or assertions here. One, inappropriate relationship. 
Two, did he know or suspect that Jill was murdered due to knowledge she would not have had? And, and did you get any? I mean, did you get any useful leads from that show? It was <clears throat> difficult, but it was also frustrating. By this stage, you've got to bear in mind, I had been doing crime work for 15 years. When I started, I didn't have any interest in crime at all. Mm. And certainly no knowledge about crime. This is a yes or no question. His answer is very important. He avoids answering yes or no, which now elevates the importance of this question. Next, we see that before answering the question, he shows his priority. It is not just his 15 years experience, but he has a need to communicate a very powerful and personal issue. He did not have any interest in crime at all. This must be believed by the audience before he answers the question. It is to say, I didn't want this. I don't like this. I did not choose this. It is a very powerful psychological distancing that he feels so important that it comes before the question of any leads into the murder. He immediately distances himself from the question. Next, the priority continues. I did not want this, and I had no knowledge of crime. Note the wording, certainly no knowledge about crime. He not only didn't want this, he needs to assert his own innocence of knowledge of crime. If he was in therapy, a well-trained therapist would recognise this as a protestation. The therapist would seek to uncover not only what specific knowledge of crime is bothering him so much, but why said knowledge is bothering him so much. Given the extremity of his denial of possible connection to the programme, he has a need to pronounce himself highly knowledgeable, so that he will be believed when he makes the denial. This itself is weakness. However, even when this setting of the stage is to be believed, his choice of wording is still personal and likely the leakage of having knowledge that he does not want to possess. It is as if to say, I know something I do not want to know. I did not ask for it. I did not want it. And I do not want it today. Therefore, I am going to wage war against it by exaggeration, ridicule or any other means at my disposal, even if it means blaming an innocent person. After 15 years, I had interviewed so many senior uh, officers, um, so many detectives, I knew quite a bit. And one thing was pretty clear to me is that you follow the evidence. You mm. don't follow your hunch. 15 years of experience led him to assert only the obvious. You follow the evidence. You don't follow your hunch. He built an expectation of wisdom to follow, but offered only elementary. This is a major point of weakness. He then follows the weakness with the need to ridicule. The Sherlock Holmes stuff was absolute horlicks. The need to insult should be compared to his denial of being very, very good friends above. He denied this plainly, yet the possible connection to the programme, even years later, triggers a strong emotional need to persuade. And the evidence here, right from the start, did not point to where the public clamour was pointing. The public clamour was pointing to this being a conspiracy. And everybody at first said it's because of Crime Watch. Sensitivity is very high, as we see in the negative and the need for the lengthy sentence. Note this is indicative of psychological closeness, and this being a conspiracy is stated without a direct quote. The reader or analyst should consider a possible embedded admission. It is the public clamour being given voice. Well, yeah, I mean, that Jill would have presented some segment on some underworld gang lord or something yeah. that wanted to wreak revenge. Instead of allowing the interviewee to present what conspiracy, the interviewer gives him the answer. This is a mistake. He introduces gang lord into the conversation. We do not know if this is what the subject was referencing. Whatever the subject was referencing was very important to him, and this creates a diversion. The subject now has opportunity to direct his attention to gang lord rather than anything and everything else that could have been on his mind. This is a critical error in interviewing. Now look, you don't have to be a fellow of the Royal Statistical Society to just do a bit of maths. We haven't had any judges being murdered for sending people down. We haven't had senior investigating officers murdered for sending 
people down for catching people. We haven't even had police sergeants murdered for doing or police constables or, for that matter, we, you know, PCOs since. I mean, it's, it's not what happens in this country. The gang lord is addressed. He gives point after point of who has not been murdered. So the idea that a television presenter who was merely, if you like, articulating an appeal would be shot. For the, it just didn't make sense. It didn't make statistical sense. It just, it, you know, that phrase that scientists know called Occam's razor, mm. that you know, never go for a more complicated explanation if it's a simple one. Well, everybody was going for the complicated explanations. His argument is that if those responsible for investigating and sentencing are not targeted, why would a reporter? This is reasonable. What is at issue is twofold. One, the interviewer introduced gang lord murder, not the subject. Two, the subject used the plural, complicated explanations, whereas gang lord murder is a singular topic. And the other things, as soon as, I mean, I knew where Jill lived. I knew that she didn't actually live there. She was staying with her boyfriend. So anybody who'd done this conspiratorially was terribly badly uh, prepared because it was pure chance she went there. Recall, he gives a legitimate argument against the gang lord targeting a voice rather than an investigator. Now compare it to his offering of conspiratorially and terribly badly prepared, ridiculing the symbol following the victim. Note who it is that brings this knowledge. I mean, I knew where Jill lived. I knew that she didn't actually. He knew. It is important that we note this. He knew. I knew is produced by him. It is repeated. We must consider what it is he knew and would warrant repetition and immediate change to the pronoun we. We then found whoever it had done it had been seen hanging around for a long time, pretty stupid, didn't have a getaway vehicle and shot Jill in a street called Gowan Avenue, which is a long, long straight street with virtually no turnoffs. Now, come on. A professional killer wouldn't having have done to that. walk away down a long street with no I mean... It is no longer what I knew, but we, which could represent knowledge that went public. This would be an appropriate change of pronoun, and should it change back to I, it will increase importance for us. Note what follows. I mean, there were so many other things, I'm not going to go through them all, but there were so many other things right from the beginning. He had the need to ridicule the idea of a professional shooter, rather than give the description of an amateur. He tells us that there were so many things that he... I knew about, but he is not going to go through them all. But, refute assertion, so many other things right from the beginning which point to timing. The element of time often indicates a change. This change can be a change in activity or in context here, a change in knowledge. This is his own knowledge, I, which we expect to continue, but it doesn't. Well, well I mean, for example, when we knew she had a key in the door when she was shot. The back and forth change from I to we is in context about knowledge. This tells us that he wishes to separate the two. There is knowledge that he has and there is knowledge that we, the public, have. The subject himself reveals the need to separate the two. This is an indication of knowledge he does not want to share. This could be knowledge that is fact-based or it could be acute suspicion. Mm. But instead of pushing her inside and shooting her there to muffle the sound, he'd shot her on the doorstep, where she'd be seen, where the sound was heard. And he has the need to tell us that this was not intelligent. Everything conspired to this not being a professional hit. For him, after all the years of interviewing investigators, the conclusion is singular, stupidity. It cannot be, for him, that the shooter was not concerned with getting caught. And yet in that first programme, it was quite clear that the police were following, as they so often do, the public clamour. This is a passive-aggressive insult of police. This means he does not wish to be seen as insulting to police, but holds this thought of contempt towards them. How would the many investigators he interviewed over so many years feel about this statement? He then further amplifies his answer and seeks to reduce the inherent insult by joining himself to the theme. It was one of the many occasions when I realised that the police are not sort of forensically independent of public opinion. They are part of public opinion. They're pushed and manoeuvred by public opinion just as the rest of us are. So it was difficult. 
But within a few weeks, they feel that they had their man at that point, didn't they, Barry George? Well, no, they didn't. It wasn't a few weeks. I and mean, that was the frustrating thing. There was a, a detective who was on the trail of Barry George. Two witnesses had rung again and again and again, saying this man was around at the time, had come to them with um, trying to get false alibis thereafter, was behaving very, very oddly, and they must look at him. They were really concerned so much they kept ringing back. But the team, including when they had reviews from Scotland Yard, kept going after the conspiracy theories. So this detective knew, but the, he, he was basically put off. And it was a year after every other lead had gone into the sand. It was a year later wow. that they went back to this. This is a claim that the crime would have been solved by a detective with the murderer being Barry George, except that this detective, unnamed, was put off from following the evidence. Note that this putting off is declared to be basically. He reduces the commitment to this assertion by adding in basically and weakens it psychologically, bringing the detective close to him, this detective, but not naming him. And when Barry George was convicted, you, you clearly thought justice was done. Was it frustrating to see him cleared? First his assumption, then his question based upon his own assumption. It was astonishing to see him convicted. I mean, I'll be honest about that. I thought that the evidence against him was very compelling indeed, as long as you think of evidence not in the way that an English court thinks of evidence. He is declaring that he is not honest about some things and honest about other things. If the evidence was very compelling, what caused this astonishment? Instead of asking this question, the interviewer offers an answer. But insofar um, as it was largely circumstantial, there was no... Exactly. Uh, no need for an explanation. It was given to the subject who accepted it plainly. The interviewer furthers his own assumption. Overwhelming mass of circumstantial evidence. Overwhelming evidence of things where the arrows pointed at his guilt. This is the assertion of the interviewer. He then moves to a rhetorical. And they had just one particle, didn't they? Well, that was the frustrating, I mean, really irritating thing, actually. The Crown Prosecution Service. People have got so used to forensic evidence, which, of course, we virtually didn't have for most of the last century. But now, unless there's forensic evidence... Ground Prosecution Service is often very, very re reluctant to prosecute. And so they wouldn't unless there was some evidence. They found this ridiculous little speck of firearms discharge rev uh, residue in one of his pockets. Please note that firearms discharge residue is considered solid evidence in a gun murder. Because this will have been a year later by the time he was arrested. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Now, it may have been relevant, may not have been re relevant. But even at the time, I was hoping they wouldn't present it because I thought it would just... I divert from all the other stuff. The subject, with 15 years' experience in dealing with crime and investigators, reduces evidence in a murder case of a close colleague to stuff. What caused him to call evidence stuff? What was all that he was not going to go into earlier? What has he offered as circumstantial evidence thus far? He has only offered what a professional murderer would not do. Did you consider leaving the show after Jill passed away? No, never, because firmly I never believed it was anything to do with Crime Watch. And I always rejected the conspiracy theories. Nor was a good answer. Instead, he goes on to never, which now weakens the denial of no. He weakens it further with the need to explain why. This is seen in the word because in his answer. Next, the reason is given in the negative with the repetition of the word never in never believed it was anything to do with Crime Watch. He is not done weakening the denial. He goes even further. And I've always rejected the conspiracy theories. He does not believe his own words. Note that he has always rejected the conspiracy theories with rejected meaning refused to accept. Also note that theories is plural meaning for him it is not just one. Had he said no without the need to persuade, it would have been much stronger. Instead, he goes into the negative, repetition and unnecessary explanation to indicate such extreme sensitivity that it belies his denial. Consider his measured response to the press, saying they were very, very good friends, and compare it to this topic. One topic produces a denial that is strong enough to stand on its own. 
The other denial shows a desperate need to persuade. He shows a vast difference in his language between the two denials. The more need to call in reinforcements, the weaker the denial. And I happen to know about the most ludicrous conspiracy theory of all. I mean, it's almost infantile. Not only do we have further ridicule, most ludicrous indicates his belief that others are also ludicrous, but he uses the word infantile. It should be noted that while in this defensive posture, he has called upon the word infantile. Here he now introduces new material to the interview. After ridicule, the topic introduced is important to the subject. It's so, it's risible, and yet it was actually used seriously in the Old Bailey. And this was that it was to do with the Yugoslav War. The subject introduces Yugoslav War. Because he introduced it, it is important to him and to us. And I'll tell you how this story came about. Alison Lewis is, or was, Jill's great confidant. She was her agent. She was a friend of mine. I know Alison, knew Alison well. Alison had been asked by the police who'd got anything against Jill. She couldn't think of anything. Weeks later, it occurred to her, well, we, we had had a letter from somebody. It wasn't a green ink letter. It was a sort of, well, I don't think you were very fair in that appeal about Yugoslavia because the Serbs had been victims as well. The Yugoslav War is introduced. Alison Lewis is introduced. Serbs are introduced. These topics are important enough for him to not only introduce, but to stress the relationship that he had and has with Jill's great confidant, Alison Lewis. He repeats his I know phrase, and in its own repetition he adds, I knew Alison well. And she mentioned this to her boss. He got quite excited about it and um, told it to some journalists. And all of a sudden, this story emerged that, you know, Slobodan Milosevic, in the middle of a, a, a civil war, hundreds and hundreds of miles away, had decided this civil war could be resolved by going and shooting an English television presenter. He introduces Slobodan Milosevic in the interview. This is done while classifying Alison Lewis's boss without name, but as one being quite excited about this information. Why the need to classify as such? Next note, hundreds of miles away, is added to the description. The interviewer always ingratiating quickly agrees. I'm insane. For a theory to be insane, that's the interviewer's language, but be the most ludicrous of all the conspiracy theories, he devotes the most amount of words to, even more than the words used to describe the deceased. I've also included some of Peter's conclusions. Nick Ross is not honestly reporting his knowledge stroke belief about the Jill Dandor murder. Ross exhibits guilt regarding what he knows about the murder. It is a powerful emotion that causes him the need to ridicule any possible connection of the programme to Jill's murder. What is very difficult to discern between is guilty knowledge versus acute suspicion. Nick Ross is withholding information in the interview about the murder of Jill Dandor. Is this information knowledge about the motive of the murder? Is it acute suspicion of the motive of the murder? To know with precision, more sample is needed. Does he feel responsible for any possible exposure to information? With Nick Ross, very high emotions are provoked within him with the topic of connecting the murder to the programme. He introduced the Yugoslav civil war with the need of promoting any connection as absurd. Investigative journalist Richard Hall presented this transcript for analysis with the question of whether it is possible that Jill Dandor died as a result of coming into contact with sensitive information via the programme, as seen only in the language of Nick Ross. Peter concludes, it is. There is language consistent with protecting very sensitive withheld information within Nick Ross's interview. That Nick Ross knows more than he is stating here is evident. Whether it is factual knowledge or acute suspicion is not known with precision. Even with approximately 16 years of processing, he does not show significant progress from his statement made shortly after the murder. This is a critical need to dismiss and ridicule, and the repeated protestations made years later only strengthen the original analysis. 16 years did not weaken his stance. That he knows or suspects Jill's murder is related somehow to her position at Crime Watch remains strong. Whether she was told, 
read or was exposed to information regarding the possible tie with political terrorism, any of these could produce guilt within Nick Ross. His friendship with her was reliably reported. It is this international connection, not Yugoslav specific, but international specific, that warrants exploration. Now, I would just like to add my own comment here at the end of Peter's analysis that the appeal Jill made about Kosovo, which I will show later, was not connected to Crime Watch. Therefore, there is no reason why Ross should feel guilty if the killer was a Kosovan hitman. In my opinion, there is a different reason for his guilt, and as the analysis shows, that reason is probably connected to Crime Watch. I want now to look at the police investigation and highlight some evidence which I believe suggests that the police were never trying to solve this case from the start. An interesting statement about the police investigation on Wikipedia reads, The original police investigation had explored the possibility of a contract killing, but since Dandor was living with her fiancé and was only rarely visiting her Gowan Avenue house, it was considered unlikely that a professional assassin would have been sufficiently well informed about Dando's movements to have known at what time she was going to be there. Also, according to police, analysis of road CCTV cameras show that she was not followed by car to her address. But hang on, it all depends on who hired the contract assassin, does it not? If the assassin was hired by the security services, which would likely be through a third party to give plausible deniability, then a professional assassin would be given sufficient information about Dando's movements. After all, this is what security services do for a living. Covertly gather information on people through a plethora of avenues available to them. A simple tap on her phone would suffice. If anyone wanted to find out Jill Dando's movements, certainly MI5 could. You might recall from my last Madeleine McCann film and lecture me talking about Sky News' Martin Brunt and about how I am convinced that he is an MI5 asset. Follow this link for details of this. I picked up this quote from the book Jill Dando, Her Life and Death by Brian Cathcart. Among crime correspondents who had picked up the rumour before 1pm was Martin Brunt of Sky News. He had received confirmation that Dando had definitely been attacked, that it was not an accident. This came not from an official Scotland Yard spokesman, but from a police source whom Brunt could not identify on air. Hmm, she was only pronounced dead at three minutes past one. Was he tipped off by MI5? The man who was put in charge of the investigation was Detective Chief Inspector Hamish Campbell, working out of the notorious Belgravia Police Station, which is known for running intelligence cover-up operations. I've mentioned it before in relation to the London bombings and the Madeleine McCann case. A man was seen leaving from outside number 29 Gowan Avenue and he ran east down this road towards the Fulham Palace Road. A man between late 30s and 40s, white, he was carrying a mobile phone, he was clean shaven and he had dark hair. The witnesses describe him as being well groomed, possibly wearing a jacket or a suit. And anybody who knows that man or anybody else who saw that person out there, we would like to speak to. Campbell had been a frequent guest on BBC's Crime Watch. Despite massive media attention, appeals for information, appeals to police informers and a £250,000 reward, for many months the investigation came up with nothing. And we can surely ask, was this because intelligence was being buried? Another clue that the investigation was being hindered is the claim that the telephone numbers given out on a subsequent Crime Watch appeal for information did not work properly. After seven months, a decision which must have come from the very top of the Met was made to appoint Brian Moore as the senior investigating officer, that is the investigation coordinator, and Hamish Campbell as the investigating officer, that is the lead day-to-day -day investigator. They took over the case on the 6th of December 99. Some of Brian Moore's history is covered in the book The Untouchables which exposes police measures to try and address corruption within the Met Police. It seems from this that the police used corrupt police officers to fight police corruption. Worthy of note is Moore's role in the Ira Thomas case. 
I won't go into all of the details, but Ira Thomas was wrongly convicted of a shooting and spent two years in prison for a crime he did not commit. The conviction came about largely because of evidence which was put together by Brian Moore and included three specks of firearm residue on a jacket belonging to the accused. One theory put forward at the time of Jill's murder was the possibility that a deranged fan may have killed her. Indeed, after a year of investigating and seemingly failing to come up with any promising leads, this theory became Moore and Campbell's main line of investigation when they focused their efforts on a man living half a mile away on Crookham Road called Barry George. He emerged as a suspect because apparently he was agitated that day and at some point after the murder he asked people to verify his movements. He was initially considered a low priority suspect and was first interviewed on the 11th of April 2000. The piece of evidence that it seems was vital in getting him wrongly convicted, as mentioned earlier, was a tiny speck of gunpowder residue. Sound familiar? Found over a year after the murder in one of his coat pockets, despite the possibility that the particle could have come from a blank firing gun or even a firework. The coat wasn't delivered to the forensic service for 15 days after seizure, but was first sent to a police studio where it was photographed. Firearms had previously been photographed in the same studio. The forensic scientist, Robin Keeley, was the one who also analysed the coat in the Ira Thomas case. Also, police who searched his flat on multiple occasions had been equipped with firearms and searched his coat pockets so the particle could have been deposited then. No further particles were found anywhere in his flat or on any of his other clothes, only the single tiny particle in a coat pocket. Significantly, neither of the two witnesses who actually saw the killer on Gowan Avenue identified Barry George as the killer. Only one witness, Jill's neighbour Susan Mays, who picked Barry George out of an identity parade over a year after the murder, placed Barry George anywhere near the murder scene. She saw a man fitting George's description and acting as though he did not want to be seen across the road from 29 Gowan Avenue at 7am, which is four and a half hours before the shooting. Barry George had a reasonable alibi, that he arrived at the Hafard Advice Centre at 11.50am and was wearing completely different clothes to the gunman. Therefore, he would not have had time to have gone home, get changed and get to the Hafad Advice Centre by 11.50. He should never have been put on trial. If it wasn't for the persistence of George and his supporters, he'd still be in prison today. We can surely ask, how the hell was George convicted in the first place? With an IQ of just 75, did Hamish Campbell see him as a soft target? Was he the perfect fall guy to enable them to close down their phony investigation? Hours after Barry George was found guilty, the BBC published an article about Campbell praising him in the most extravagant terms. Hamish Campbell, high-flying dando cop. Campbell has often been described as one of Scotland Yard's brightest stars. A high flyer who was promoted just months before the dando killing and is now awaiting a superintendent posting. Campbell was promoted to detective superintendent straight after the Jill Dando case and in 2003 he gained a further promotion to detective chief superintendent. He has been involved in a number of other high profile cases and in May 2011 was appointed senior investigating officer for the Met Police's controversial review of Madeleine McCann's reported disappearance. Weeks later he decided, no doubt with the approval of or orders from the very top that the remit of the Madeleine McCann review was to investigate the abduction of Madeleine McCann, therefore ruling out any possibility that Madeleine had died. Hamish Campbell retired from the Met in May 2013. On the day he did so, he was still claiming that he had got the right man. In an Evening Standard headline he was quoted as saying, we did all we could to catch Jill Dando's killer. And we did it twice. Jill Dando did have numerous relationships prior to meeting Alan Farthing. Having read a few books about her private life and having learned about 
a piece of evidence from the police investigation, which I will spare everyone's blushes by not mentioning, it is fair to say she was quite promiscuous. Some theories relate to this, that a jealous ex-boyfriend or an unknown lover had killed her, perhaps after learning about her engagement. I'm not aware of any direct evidence for this. A case of mistaken identity has also been put forward as a potential motive. Again, I'm not aware of any evidence to support this either. One person who was very close to Jill Dando, who mentioned in an interview the reason for Jill's death, is Toya Wilcox. Former pop star Wilcox worked with Jill Dando on the holiday programme, and they shared an office together at the BBC. Wilcox said in one interview, And I had a very, very bad experience when my work colleague, Jill Dando, was murdered. I was advised never to go to the same address at the same time for at least three months, and it took a long time to get over that. From that comment, it sounds like either the police or an intelligence agency has spoken to her or her agent. In another interview in 2002, when responding to a question about Jill's death, she said, Death isn't the problem, it's the reason. Um, I think death is actually a glorious thing. It's the reason this happened. Um, it's so evil. And again, that's made me incredibly angry that a very beautiful woman was wiped out and very publicly. This was a very curious statement. Why would Toya Wilcox claim to know the reason for Jill's murder? Who told her? Was she told about the reason by the same source that advised her never to go to the same address at the same time on different days? I was so curious about this, I decided to try and meet Toya Wilcox and discover what her reason was. So I booked a ticket to go and see her, performing at a music festival in Stowe on the Wold in October 2017, in the hope I could speak to her afterwards. I'm in a place called Stowe on the Wold and the reason why I've come here is because there's a pop concert on today. Uh, Toya Wilcox, I've got me ticket. I'm going to try and get to speak to her. I don't know whether I will be able to. The, um, the pop concert is called Up Close and Personal. So hopefully I'll, I'll get to speak to her. I suspect that she's been told a bogus reason. However, uh, I would like to know what she's been told about that. <laughs> I've just come out of the Toya gig. Now after the gig, they went off stage. I wasn't sure that she was gonna come back, um, but she got changed and then she came back and there was a few people hanging around wanting autographs and that kind of thing. So I waited my turn uh, and then when I spoke to her, I said, uh, I'm researching and making a film about Jill Dando. She seemed interested. Uh, so I gave her um, the Madeline DVD box set of all the films and I gave her the Peter Hyatt DVD and also my business card with my number on it and I said it would be good to do an interview with you about Jill Dando and I said um, I believe that I know the reason I used her word the reason and straight away she said is it to do with Serbia right and I said well no I don't think it is so I suspect that when she's been quoted as saying that she knows the reason that's what I think is in her head, or that's probably what she's been told. There was probably at least a dozen people listening to every word I was saying to her, right? And I didn't want to start getting into graphic detail about a very close friend that she had lost just after she's finished this uh, you know, quite nice concert that she's given and all these people are there to see her singing. They're not really there to hear me asking her about a friend being murdered, right? So I didn't want to waste my chances of getting a potential interview with Toya, right? So for that reason, I didn't say, oh, when did you last see her? 
why do you think she was murdered? Uh, I just kept it very brief. Hopefully she'll be intrigued and wonder what my reasoning is after she's watched the, the Madeline films. From this, it is quite clear to me that when Toya refers to the reason, she is referring to the Serbian hitman theory. So let's come on to that one. The former Yugoslavia went through changes in the 1990s during a series of armed conflicts, resulting in it breaking up into separate states. In 1998, a war in Kosovo had started, which resulted in a humanitarian crisis. Three weeks before Jill's death, she presented this appeal. This Easter weekend, we've all become aware of the humanitarian crisis facing the Balkans as thousands of people from Kosovo have left their homes and arrived on the borders of neighbouring countries. This is a massive exodus. Around 600,000 people are on the move. These refugees have been walking for days. When they arrive, they're dehydrated, hungry, exhausted and cold, and yet there's nowhere to house them. The main countries they're fleeing to, Albania, Macedonia and the region of Montenegro, are poor and they can't cope with this mass influx. That's why the Disasters Emergency Committee is today launching an appeal on behalf of 12 leading UK aid agencies. They need your help to provide food and shelter to the refugees who have nowhere else to turn. The temperatures in the Balkans still drop to below freezing at night and yet thousands of people are having to sleep outside. Keeping warm is virtually impossible. The refugees need shelter. Food is scarce. Children and old people are the least able to cope. Some are already losing the fight for life through sickness and exposure. And the aid agencies fear that disease will take hold if clean water and proper sanitation isn't provided quickly. Most aid agencies were already working in the former Yugoslavian region and they were quickly in action, but to meet the massive demand of this humanitarian crisis, they need your help. This article from the 28th of April states, Police were last night still struggling to find anyone who wanted to harm Jill Dando. Detectives were even studying a suggestion that she was an innocent target for the revenge over the NATO bombing of Serbian TV studios last week. They said Jill may have been singled out as the face of British TV because she recently presented the high-profile humanitarian appeal to aid Kosovan refugees. This theory was further developed in the media on the 29th of April when it was claimed that the BBC head of news had received a death threat. The anonymous call which named Tony Hall as a target is being investigated by detectives hunting the killer of Jill Dandor. One police source said the caller claimed to be a Serb seeking revenge for NATO's bombing of TV studios in Belgrade last week. Strange how the death threat came shortly after the theory was espoused in the media, not before. In my opinion, this all looks like it was concocted by someone running the cover-up as a convenient diversion. Remember there were media stories wrongly suggesting the London nail bombings were carried out by a Serbian group as well. Perhaps this probably bogus motive was fed to Toya Wilcox and perhaps also to Nick Ross. Another theory for the assassination is that somebody had hired an assassin to murder Dando as a revenge for their being convicted as a result of evidence garnered by Crime Watch viewers. Probably the most interesting example of a criminal who might fit the bill is Kenneth Noy. A number of details about Kenneth Noy's case do cause one to pause and consider a possible link. In his time, Noy was a major gangland criminal. He was sentenced to 14 years in 1986 for helping to launder proceeds of the Brinks Mat robbery. He killed a police surveillance officer in the grounds of his own home, but his defence of self-defence was accepted. Noy was involved in an incident in 1996 whilst driving his Range Rover, where he is said to have stopped at traffic lights, got out of his car and stabbed Stephen Cameron to death with a nine-inch knife on an M25 slip road. It was described as a road rage attack but I have seen on internet forums people claiming it could have been a drug-related killing. 
Within days of that killing, an EFIT was released and broadcast on Crime Watch. Shortly after that, it was announced in the press that police were seeking Kenneth Noy in relation to the murder. After watching the broadcast, Noy was rapidly whisked out of the country in a helicopter belonging to his friend Johnny Palmer. At the end of August 98, Noy was apprehended on the Costa del Sol and on the 26th of April 99, whilst Noy was in prison awaiting trial, Jill Dando was killed. As you will recall, a Range Rover may have been used in the Dando shooting, which apparently was Noy's favoured type of vehicle. In April 2000, Noy was finally convicted of the Stephen Cameron murder. There were two primary witnesses at that trial, the girlfriend of Cameron, who was in the witness protection programme, and one Alan de Cabral. De Cabral gave evidence at the Old Bailey, having refused a similar offer of witness protection. He told the jury that he would never forget Noy's face, stating that after he stabbed Cameron to death, he looked at him and nodded towards him, as if to say, job done. However, de Cabral was a former member of an outlaw biker gang and had been raided for drugs and guns before he gave evidence. The question arises, was he a bogus witness designed to help get Noy convicted of murder rather than manslaughter? In October 2000, six months after Noy's conviction, de Cabral, whilst sitting in his car outside Halfords, was shot in the head at point-blank range with a single shot from a handgun. So, the de Cabral and Dando murders were two seemingly separate incidents, but with identical methods of killing. One theory goes that Kenneth Noy ordered one or both of these killings as revenge. However, Noy's appeal centred around having de Cabral questioned again, so he could be proven to have lied at the original trial. So whoever did kill de Cabral might have helped keep Kenneth Noy in prison. The de Cabral killer was described as a man in his 20s, and remember, Kenneth Noy was in jail when both these murders occurred, so there's no suggestion he executed the murders himself. In subsequent appeals by Noy against his conviction, the wife of de Cabral offered to give evidence, claiming that her dead husband had lied about seeing Noy murdering Stephen Cameron. Is it possible that de Cabral and Dando were killed by the same hitman, but on behalf of the state, not Kenneth Noy. The next and final possible motive I want to delve into for the assassination of Jill Dando is linked to the possibility that she knew about organised abusive children by personalities including Jimmy Savile at the BBC, and that she tried to expose this by informing senior management in the mid-1990s. In July 2014, a report appeared in the Daily Star Sunday exploring these claims, and it was implied that this may have prompted a revenge attack on Jill. Since this article was published, the theory has gained a very large following. Some very interesting films have been produced, which can be viewed online, that explore the links between Jill Dando, her close friend Cliff Richard and Jimmy Savile and explore theories that Jill Dando was murdered because of what she knew about establishment paedophilia. The documentaries cover information which came out following the Jimmy Savile revelations. They are well worth watching and implicate the BBC for protecting paedophile celebrities and politicians. They also look at police corruption, at those who have been involved in organising and covering up child abuse within the political establishment and the many suspicious deaths of celebrities who may have known too much. Before I look at this, I just want to remind people of my Madeleine McCann work and that I have published lectures where I talk about establishment paedophilia and about how paedophilia can and is being used to control politicians and people of influence. Here is an internet post accusing me of such things. Hall is out to rudely dig up paedophiles in political office, like a farmer digging up a badger den, and Hall sees pedos running out of every hole. Let's bear in mind that Dando was murdered nearly 20 years ago in 1999, and this story first surfaced in July 2014, over 15 years after her murder. The story also claims that she reported to senior management in the mid-1990s. No specific year is given, but this is a number of years before her murder. 
the article was published by mainstream journalist Don Hale, MBE, as I mentioned in the Daily Star Sunday. This is the first time anywhere it was suggested that Jill Dando may have been on a mission to expose establishment paedophilia. Murdered TV presenter Jill Dando tried to expose a paedophile ring involving big-name BBC stars, a former colleague has claimed. According to the retired BBC worker, the Crime Watch host was told that DJs, stars and corporation staff were involved in organised abuse. But when she tried to get bosses to investigate the alleged ring and other abuse complaints inside the BBC, no one wanted to know, the former friend said. Undeterred, Jill is said to have raised the claims with senior management in the mid-1990s, but no investigation took place. The TV host was shot dead a few years later on the doorstep of her London home. The 37-year-old's murder remains unsolved. Her ex-colleague, who asked to remain anonymous, said, I don't recall the names of all the stars now, and I don't really want to implicate anyone, but Jill said they were surprisingly big names. I think she was quite shocked when told about images of children and that information on how to join this horrible paedophile ring was freely available. Jill said others had complained to her about sexual matters and that some fellow female workmates also claimed they had been groped or assaulted. Nothing had been done and there seemed to be a policy of turning a blind eye. The source told how female colleagues went to Jill, who was then one of the best known faces on TV. She said, I think it was in the mid-1990s. Jill was working on almost everything then, including Crime Watch and Holiday. She was seen as the face of the BBC and a magnet for women with problems. She compiled a file of complaints, but she was not really an investigative journalist, just a presenter. She passed the information to someone else and they gave it back. No one wanted to know. I do remember that she gave a file to senior management. I don't think she heard any more. Other women who complained told Jill they didn't want to risk their careers by making official statements against individuals, as they would lose their jobs, and that bosses seemed to ignore it. We all decided the best way was to keep our heads down and to always try to go somewhere with a colleague. The BBC said it would look into the allegations, but added, we have not seen anything to substantiate these claims. Presenters Liz Kershaw and Miriam O'Reilly have both made allegations of sexual harassment at the BBC. After Jimmy Savile was exposed as a paedophile and serial sex attacker in 2012, fellow BBC presenter Sally Jones spoke of how he had tried to grope her in a lift. She confided in Jill after the attack, adding that the Crime Watch host said she had had to fend off plenty of unwelcome advances herself. Sally said Jill told her Savile was just a dirty old perv. Jill was shot dead on the doorstep of her home in Fulham in 1999. Barry George was found guilty of her murder in 2001, but his conviction was quashed in 2008. Jill joined a campaign to help children spot paedophiles the year before she died. Note that all the claims about Jill informing senior management come from an unnamed source, and we aren't told exactly when this was, just that she thinks it was in the mid-90s. The bit at the end featuring Sally Jones is a rehash of the same claims made in a Daily Mail article dating back to 2012. It looks like the Sally Jones part was added to the article so that we at least have one person who is named talking about Dando in relation to Savile. And we need to be clear, the article does not claim that Sally Jones knew anything about Jill Dando informing senior management. That person is not named. We need to go back in time a little to put these articles into context. Jimmy Savile died in October 2011, and at that time, every mainstream publication praised him in their obituaries for his endless charity work. Not a hint that he was a ruthless paedophile who preyed on just about anyone he could get his hands on. Not until a year later did the media, overnight it seemed, changed their opinion and went into overdrive, suddenly being able to find dozens of victims ready to testify to his disgusting behaviour. It was as though a high-up decision was made in September 2012, which gave the media a green light to go after him. The first major expose was aired on ITV in a programme called Exposure on the 3rd of October 2012. 
and the BBC had prevented an item on a Newsnight programme from being aired, which investigated Savile almost a year earlier, just after his death. So why weren't mainstream media exposing him before 2012, or for that matter, before his death? So, at that time, when the dam burst in October 2012, Sally Jones was one of dozens of others who the media published statements from within a tidal wave of truth about the disgusting, lecherous vulture that was Jimmy Savile. BBC's Sally Jones, Pervert Savile groped me in lift, and Jill Dando warned me of unwelcome advances at breakfast time office. Sally Jones' close encounter with Jimmy Savile remains one of the worst EU moments of her life. Acrid taste of cigar smoke almost made me wretch as I froze, cringing as he ran one hand up my waist and fumbled for my breast. So I ask the question, why was Don Hill's article published nearly two years later on the 21st of July 2014? Did the unnamed source only come forward in July 2014 after keeping quiet for almost 20 years? What prompted the source to come forward? There is no mention in the article from the source that they reported this information to the police after Dando was murdered. We know that the police were ostensibly fishing about for possible motives. So surely, if a colleague of Jill Dando knew about a motive for the murder, that colleague should have reported it to the police, either in confidence or anonymously, as soon as they heard about the murder. There is no mention of this in Don Hale's article. Was there something significant happening in July 2014 or just before then within the Gildando case that might have prompted this sudden confession? I discussed Barry George earlier, who was wrongly convicted of Jill's murder and spent eight years in prison. George was acquitted in August 2008, but was not awarded any compensation. Understandably, George has been trying unsuccessfully to get compensation to this day. It was reported in this article in the Daily Telegraph on the 16th of March 2014, Barry George takes compensation claim to Europe. Barry George, the man wrongly accused of murdering TV presenter Jill Dando, is taking his £1 million compensation claim to the European Court of Human Rights. In April 2010, it emerged that the Ministry of Justice had denied Mr George's claim of £1.4 million compensation. A High Court application for compensation was refused, with judges rejecting his claim that the Justice Secretary had unfairly and unlawfully decided he was not innocent enough. Then last year, judges at the Court of Appeal ruled Mr George was not innocent enough to be eligible for a payoff and the case was thrown out. Now, in a last-ditch attempt for former stuntman, originally from Walsall, West Midlands, he is taking his claim to the European Court of Human Rights. So, to put it another way, a court which is outside of the UK and is therefore not subject to any interference by UK authorities or MI5 is going to be looking at the Jill Dando case. Think about that. Because in order to determine whether Barry George should get compensation, the court would surely have to look at the evidence within the case files. If this case was a cover-up, I don't think MI5 would be happy that the European Court of Human Rights is going to be re-examining their crooked investigation. So the question does arise, and it is an uncomfortable question for me to ask, was the Don Hale article put out into the media as a result of this legal development? Is the article a red herring designed to muddy the waters with another bogus motive? If Dando was killed because of what she knew about David Copeland and knew he could have easily been arrested after the Brixton nail bomb, then the Savile story has provided an effective diversion. I will leave it up to you to decide. I am not ruling out any of the motives discussed in this film altogether, including the Savile motive. Right, I've just spoken to Peter Morpurgo, who was the studio director of the final show that Jill Dando recorded for Crime Watch UK. Um, uh, elderly -ish chap, probably in his mid 70s, he's retired, but really nice guy. Uh, he answered all my questions, 
and we seemed very very cooperative um, now let me go through some of the things that that uh, I discussed with him it was just at his front door uh, I didn't try and get in his house or ask ask for him to be go on camera or anything like that so um, I told him that I was researching the Jill Dando case could I ask him a few questions he said no problem um, now I asked him if he can remember her talking about anything in particular at the end of the show uh, and what he said was generally speaking they would prepare things before the show and after the show there wouldn't be that much discussion she would go off and do a holiday program the production team would go off and work on other programs he said that he, he, he did crime watch for 16 years and he would regularly have a chat with Jill in the bar after the programs but it wouldn't they might touch on some of the um, cases but it would generally be about more sort of personal issues he said for example that she was over the moon about um, becoming engaged and she spoke about that and he said that she couldn't understand what all the fuss was about uh, the fact that she she just got engaged but he said that she was extremely pleased about about a uh, upcoming marriage um, so I asked him specifically about the Brixton nail bomb and I asked him if he could remember that that was discussed on the program he had no recollection of it at all and then he, when I asked him that he said well I've been doing this for 16 years there's multiple cases on every show he says I, there's no way I could remember that um, so he had those so there's no recollection of, of of Jill announcing that there was men on the roof with binoculars uh, now I did discuss the whole Savile theory with him and he hadn't even heard of that theory right I said to him well there are a number of conspiracy theories about Jill's death um, one of them is involving Jimmy Savile and he kind of frowned and said Jimmy Savile uh, and I said yeah well I said it's alleged so some people allege that she was going to blow the whistle on Savile and uncover is what we all know now basically and who he was linked to on hearing that he just shook his head and said well he thought that he might have heard something from her about it because he did discuss personal issues after the show and he, and he also went on to say that she just wasn't that type of person she wasn't the type of person to speak ill of anyone she was um, very very modest he described her as he just said that she was a really lovely person and he, he couldn't imagine anyone like Jill Dando uh, doing such a thing it, it quite surprised him when I suggested it he did mention the, I'm not sure if it's a Kosovan hitman, because they'd done some appeal for that. He, he mentioned that he knew about that, but he didn't know whether it was relevant or not. I asked him if the police spoke to him. He said that a couple of days after the murder, the police did come into the studio and spoke to them as a group. The, the, some of the production team and they were just asking people whether they had any relevant information they didn't sit down and interview the, the production team individually they were, they were asked as a group yeah and just to reiterate he said that she never ever mentioned Jimmy Savile in any of the conversations that he, he had with her and he was on the show for many years with her and he would regularly speak just informally in the bar after the programme I asked him about the Crime Watch update that I haven't been able to get hold of uh, and he's given me the department at the BBC that would deal with that. He said it definitely was recorded, he said it would probably be on one inch tape but it would only be about seven minutes long. She didn't see herself as a star, he said. She said that, he said that she was a lovely person. Well yeah, he also wanted to know how I got his address. <laughs> just remembered part of the conversation that I had with Peter Morpurgo who was the studio director of the last show featuring Jill Dando. He was asking what my theory was so 
I, I, I just said, well, I, I think security services might have been involved. And I don't think he even understood what I meant. He said, oh, well, I don't think Jill had any security. He thought I meant that she had bodyguards or something like that. He didn't realise that I meant um, the Secret Service. Of, of the, uh, so this, that's completely off his radar, as it would be most people's. As part of my investigation, I have tried to talk to people who were with Jill immediately before the time of her death. The following people spoke to Jill at some point after the last Crime Watch show. Anastasia Cook, possible, she was due to meet her for lunch the day she died. Hilary Kay, Antiques Roadshow presenter, was with Jill between the 21st and 23rd. Lars Tharp, Antiques Roadshow presenter, was with Jill between 21st and 23rd. Geoffrey Archer was at a dinner function on the 24th. Alistair Stewart on the 24th. Sally and David Lomax, friends of Alan Farthing and Jill Dando, Sunday dinner on the 25th. Obviously Alan Farthing. Jenny Hyam, who was Jill's friend, who introduced Alan Farthing to Jill. She had a phone call with Jill on the 26th before she was murdered. And Alison Lewis, which was Jill's agent, who also had a phone call with Jill on the 26th. I exchanged a few emails with Lars Tharp, Antiques Roadshow presenter, who had no recollection of Jill talking about the nail bombings. However, if you think about this, let's say Jill left the studio assuming the police were going to immediately arrest Copeland due to the information she witnessed. She probably would not have given it another thought until the next bomb went off. It is unlikely she would have learned about the Brick Lane bomb on the Saturday as she was going to a dinner function. So I think people she spoke to on Sunday or Monday might have learned about her concerns. It's interesting that two of the people on this list, two doctors, Hyam and Lomax, I got an email reply from both of their secretaries. Both secretaries said they would forward my email, but neither of these doctors bothered to respond. They are both close friends of Alan Farthing. One person that I did manage to make contact with was Geoffrey Archer. Geoffrey Archer was good friends with Jill Dando, and I read that they once had dinner together in 1996. On Saturday the 24th of April 99, which was the night of the second nail bomb, just two days before Jill's murder, Jill played host with newsreader Alistair Stewart at a charity ball in the National History Museum to raise funds for the Royal British Legion. With her and Alan on the top table was the famous author Geoffrey Archer. Apparently Archer danced with Jill that night, and he also raised money by selling a dance with Jill Dando to a member of the audience for £400. Anyway, I wondered if Jill mentioned anything to Geoffrey Archer. Did she discuss Tuesday's crime watch or mention the Brixton nail bombing? I thought he would be a good person to speak to, so I submitted a query to Geoffrey Archer's website, leaving my mobile phone number, giving a little bit of information about my research. Two days later, to my total surprise, I got a call on my mobile phone from the man himself, Geoffrey Archer. I was quite surprised that he phoned, so I did not have time to record the call. Right, incredible. Uh, I've just had a telephone call of Geoffrey Archer. I, <laughs> I, I kid you not, right? He, he, he said that he has no recollection that she mentioned uh, the nail bombs. And um, he said he was friends with her from Western Supermare. And I did ask him if, he, if he'd had dinner with Jill Dando a few years earlier. And he admitted that he had. Um, he said that uh, he knew that she was very close to Cliff Richard because apparently there was some function in Western Supermare that him, Dando and Cliff Richard were at. And he said it was obvious to him then that they were very close. Uh, and I mentioned to him some of the theories about Dando possibly going to reveal Savile and again he he he, d he appeared not even to have any knowledge of that uh, he did mention Leon Britton and he was dismissing uh, the fact that the, the people think that Leon Britton was involved in paedophilia um, but yeah I, I kind of give him some of the outline of when the uh, nail bombings occurred in relation to when the Crime Watch program aired and when she was murdered, the fact that their their nail bomb, Crime Watch program, nail bomb, Jill Dando's murder, nail bomb. 
and I also because he was interested I wasn't quite sure how much to tell him but I, I did tell him I didn't I didn't think um, well my, my thought was well if I tell him he's um, and he thinks I'm correct he's more likely to give me information so I did tell him where I was going with it and he said interesting very interesting I, I, I kind of explained to him that some of these lone nutter events with people who were attached to certain organizations in his case an extreme right-wing organization they're not necessarily acting alone there may be people behind them that some of these groups like combat 18 may even have been set up by intelligence or infiltrated i know that they're infiltrated by intelligence and i said to him that well maybe he was being watched and the second um bomb could have been prevented and jail dando maybe knew that that's what i said to him and he, he seemed very intrigued by that. He sort of said, ah, oh, yeah, it's interesting. And he said, good luck with, with what you're doing. So really surprised to get a phone call from Jeffrey Archer. <laughs> so he didn't even withhold his number. One person I have not mentioned much is Jill's fiancé, Alan Farthing. If she spoke to anyone about what she had learned about the London nail bombings and possibly David Copeland, it would be Alan Farthing. I wonder whether Farthing remembers, in the last week of her life, Jill discussing her last Crime Watch show. He has given only a few media interviews and uses a public relations advisor. He didn't appear, from what I could gather, apart from the Crime Watch reconstruction, to actively campaign to try and find Jill's killer. He chose to put his trust in the police. And he is somebody who knew of her movements on the morning she was killed. She spent the Sunday night before her death at his house. Some have asked questions about Farthing and whether he played a role in her death. I'll give you my opinion in a second, but I just want to show you one of the questions he was asked by Anna Ford in a TV interview at Kensington Police Station two days after the murder, which I find curious. She asked him, does it worry you that it may remain unsolved? Just think about that question. This is two days after the murder when surely everyone was confident that the case will be solved. It's a very negative question. Does it worry you that it may remain unsolved? Who was feeding Anna Ford her questions that day? Does whoever prepared that question have foreknowledge? Foreknowledge that the case was going to remain unsolved, which it absolutely has. Why would anyone be talking about the case remaining unsolved at such an early stage? Another thing I find interesting about Alan Farthing is his subsequent success as a gynaecologist and surgeon. In September 2008, he was appointed gynaecologist to the Queen. That's quite an achievement considering there are hundreds of gynaecologists practicing in London. And he oversaw the deliveries of royal babies Kate Middleton's first two children. Now, just before he was given employment by the Queen, in August is when Barry George was acquitted of Jill Dando's murder. Now imagine if somebody that you thought had killed your fiancé was cleared of the crime. You're going to want the case reopened, are you not? But the police did not reopen the case. So could these decisions be linked? My guess and I don't state this as fact, is that Alan Farthing was rewarded for keeping relatively quiet about his fiancée's death, and importantly, for not demanding that the investigation be reopened when George was acquitted. This would have been a very sensitive time for those running the cover-up, i.e. the time when the official scapegoat was released. Alan Farthing received a handwritten letter from Prime Minister Tony Blair, and Jill Dando's father received a letter from the Queen. Unusual? Could these letters be further evidence of state involvement? If Jill Dando did know that David Copeland was the London nail bomber before her death, there is another person who might know about this, and that is Chief Superintendent David Hatcher, who is standing next to Jill and clearly has visibility of her notes. I managed to find David Hatcher's address and went to ask him if he would speak to me about it. 
I've come to Maidstone to try and speak to David Hatcher, so let's see if he is as friendly in real life as he is on the TV show. Uh. That this house looked like there was no one in, there was no cars on the drive, I knocked on the door. Sure enough, David Hatcher answers the door. A little bit older, obviously, than when he appears on the Crime Watch show, but it was definitely him. So here's how the conversation went. Hi, David, is it? Yes. Hi, David, my name's Richard Hall. I'm doing some research into the life of Jill Dando. I just wondered if you'd answer a few questions. Why are you doing that? I'm making a film which is exploring some of the theories. Right, would you like to write to me? and tell me what you are doing and why you are doing it, because I don't undertake cold calls, which is what this is. Whereabouts are you from? I'm from Newcastle originally, but I live in South Wales now. My business is called Rich Planet. I then gave him my business card, which had my name, mobile number and email address on it. I'm making a film exploring the various, some of them conspiracy theories, some of them a bit more solid, let's say. He then looks at the business card. Don't tell me very much, does it? It's got my number on there and my email address. Yeah, no address, no home address, no business address, nothing. It's not terribly professional. I'll put my website address on there if you'd like. Well, I can get that from richplanet.net. It seems a bit odd to me that you came out of the blue. You rock up and hope I might suddenly be here. Who else are you seeing in this area? No one in this area. I've spoken to Geoffrey Archer, Toya Wilcox, and I've also spoken to Peter Morpurgo, who was the studio director. Yes, I know, Peter. Why didn't you think to send an advanced warning that you were doing that? Uh, well, it's just the way that I work. Not very professional from where I'm standing. I really don't want to get involved in this now, because I don't know what you're doing, and I don't know whether you've got any remit from the family members, and they're happy with it. There's no remit from the family. Realising I was going to get nothing from him, I decided to change my tack. Would you like me to tell you why I think she was killed? Hatcher then says, I listen. I then showed him a still from Jill's final show, featuring himself and Jill standing together, and explained this was six days before she was killed, and that the Brixton nail bomber case was featured on this final show, and occurred three days before the show aired and that a call from a member of the public claimed there were people on a nearby roof with binoculars. He could not remember this call, nor the case. I also explained to him that my research had led me to believe the people on the roof were working for Special Branch and were watching the bomb being placed. I then showed him a CCTV still of Copeland at Brixton and asked if he recognised it. He claimed to have no recollection at all of the Brixton nail bomb case. I asked if he could remember seeing CCTV, which was going to be aired, but which was suppressed. And I asked him could he remember a phone call due to be aired from the bomber. Again, he claimed to have no recollection. He said he could not remember and that he did not have a very good memory. For this film, I have consulted with a few people who are very well read on what you might call the underworld and on the various UK crime families that run organised crime. One name has come to my attention as possibly being involved in the Dandol murder, and I have seen three separate pieces of evidence which are not direct evidence, but which when considered together make me believe this person may have been involved. All the evidence I have is in the public domain if you know where to look, and it's not new evidence. The problem is I do not know the person was involved, I only suspect. So if I were to present the evidence I have in this film and name that person, it could potentially ruin that person's life, which is not fair to do if they were not involved. Give the evidence to the police, I hear some of you say. Well, the police already know about the evidence I have. In fact, they knew about it in 1999. I believe the police, or a small group who were in charge of the investigation, already know who killed Jill Dando. People need to realise we don't live in the world that is portrayed in films, dramas and even documentaries, where there is a clear line between the goodies and the baddies. It's not just members of the public that break the law. The police and government agencies do it too. They know who killed Dando, so me giving them evidence they already have would be pointless. 
If you want this case solved, you have to become political. I'd like now to point out some other things that were happening at the time of the London nail bombings and the Jill Dandor murder. On the 20th of April, which was the same day the Crime Watch show aired, in the United States, a very prominent mass shooting took place at Columbine High School in South Denver. In total, 15 people were killed, including the two young perpetrators. Between the 23rd and 25th of April, a NATO summit was being held in the United States in Washington, D.C. So what, you might say? If you do some research, you will discover that NATO has been involved in international terrorism, and some consider NATO a terrorist organisation. You can research Operation Gladio, and also NATO's alleged involvement in supporting ISIS, if you have the time. It's probably off most people's radar, but at this conference, were they comparing notes about false flag operations involving mind control techniques being run in Britain, Copeland and the United States, Columbine, both which kicked off immediately before the NATO conference? Afternoon. Uh, I've obviously had a report on this. All I would say is that uh, we will carry on the inquiries you would expect us to make in an incident of this, this kind. These things are, are outrageous that we will not tolerate and we'll make every effort to find out who those responsible and they will be prosecuted and brought to justice. There's no doubt about that at all. I'd like now to illustrate an aspect of how the cover-up of the Dandor murder is maintained. This is Mark Williams Thomas, who you might remember was a regular commentator on the Madeleine McCann case. Williams Thomas claims to have been given exclusive access to the Dando police files, and also claims to have a list from the police files of over a hundred suspects' names. He then claims to have met one of the suspects on the list, showed him the entire list. The suspect then identifies a name on the list of a person he said stands out to him. The man he identifies is not named, nor does Williams make any meaningful progress because it appeared he isn't actually given the name. So a man who he doesn't name is shown a list we don't see and recognises the name he won't reveal. Thanks, Mark. On a This Morning show, he seemed to contradict this video piece by saying the man he met did give him the name of the man who stands out to him. But for me... Here is the important part of this little piece, which in my opinion shows the real reason for putting it out. I wouldn't identify that person. Because? I couldn't, because it's very dangerous. You have lived in that world, but even now you're still fearful about how much you can say. Of course I am. Worried that if you said too much, someone might come after you? Sure that they would come after me. What Williams Thomas is doing here is subtly threatening anyone who has real information, intended to scare them, informing them that it would be very dangerous to come forward. In my opinion, Williams Thomas is being employed to divert attention away from the information you have seen in this film. In other words, I suspect he is an agent of the very organisation that I believe probably killed Jill Dando. If the police investigation was a cover-up, acting on orders from MI5, as I believe the evidence suggests, why the hell would MI5 then allow the police to give anyone access to the police files? The only logical reason, in my opinion, why they would do this is if that person is part of MI5 and is working as an operative to help them put out media disinformation. Williams Thomas, if you recall, was discussed in my last Madeleine McCann film. Lots of evidence, in my opinion, that he is a state asset, assisting in state cover-ups, but posing as a true crime investigator. Think about it. If the security services are going to put out disinformation about criminal cases into the media, who are they likely to use? They will use fake crime experts, fake retired detectives, fake criminologists. 
Indeed, in my opinion, the mainstream media is littered with fake investigators, fake reporters and fake TV shows like Panorama and Dispatches, who might give you some juicy tidbits of information to satisfy your curiosity. But their main hidden motive is to steer you well away from any state involvement and it is the state who are the ones steering these programmes and reporters. It's interesting that Williams Thomas has been given a platform on ITV television for this, not the BBC. I wonder why that might be. My conclusion for the Dando assassination is that it is likely Jill was murdered on the orders of British intelligence. If so, the order was probably given on or around the 21st of April 99, and she had to be killed as soon as possible. Also, that the hit was ordered via intermediaries. In such a way, there would be no traceable link or paper trail back to MI5. So possibly an underworld hitman paid in cash, or an armed state group, like the Special Reconnaissance Regiment, who I believe killed John Charles de Menzies. If this conclusion is correct, it means the police will never be able to solve the case. So what's the moral of the story? The first moral is we need, as a nation, to remove the security services completely. They are not protecting the public as they are supposed to. They have committed so many criminal acts that a vast amount of their time and effort is spent using your money simply to cover up their own mistakes. The second moral of the story is that we, everyone, you and me, should not wash our hands of responsibility, no matter how difficult that may seem. If you are asked to do something you believe is wrong, or see something that you believe is wrong, you must not take the easy option and keep your head down. You must shoulder responsibility. If individuals are not going to take responsibility, then who the hell is? Too many people go with the flow. Too many people walk the easy path. Too many people are afraid to take a stand. That is why cases like this are able to be covered up, because good men do nothing. I am sure there are people who know exactly why Jill Dando was murdered and know who did it, but have done nothing to bring it into the open. It's never too late for you to put that right. Thank you.